so let me start so good morning everyone welcome to the morning session our first speaker today is professor rajibul islam from waterloo university his research interest revolves around quantum information processing in particular quantum simulations and computations presently his team is building a quantum simulator with laser cooled trapped ions uh, to simulate models of interacting quantum many body uh, systems uh, he is also involved in the building of quantum ion i think this is a name for a multi user open access trapped ion uh, quantum computer at waterloo so this must be some exciting project he is into right now where he is contributing to its building he has uh, been working in this field uh, for very long and he has some exciting results very recently i see that there are some exciting results like measuring entanglement entropy in quantum many body systems which is published in nature and so on with this introduction i would like to request uh, professor islam to take over the stage and tell us about his research okay thank you very much thanks for the invitation okay let me share my screen okay let's see You see the full screen, right? Yes. And it's advancing, changing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for um, the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I know it's very early in the morning, so I think uh, people are still waking up. I will try to keep it very um, basic and pedagogical. So um, I'm going to talk about quantum simulations with laser-cooled trapped ions, and I am not assuming any knowledge from the audience. You know, you don't need to know trapped ions. I'm going to talk about it. First, you see the picture on my title screen here. It's an, an animated image looking. And what you're seeing here, you know, each blob of light, it's actually a single atom, a single atomic ion is a charged atom. And uh, in our apparatus, we can actually trap and work with single individual atoms. They are laser cooled to very low temperatures, very low meaning, you know, lower than a millikelvin going into microkelvin kind of temperatures, where we uh, can actually talk about quantum mechanical concepts that we study in textbooks, for example, zero point motion. We actually observe those in these systems. And uh, so this talk is going to be uh, part how we get to such a low temperature system. Um, and then what do we do with such a system? And how can we make use of these trapped ions to simulate interacting quantum systems uh, that may be useful? So uh, with that introduction, I want to quickly show my you know, research group, most of the work I'm going to be talking about are done by them. Um, very bright postdoc grad students and lots of undergraduates. Um, before I start talking about quantum simulation, I'd just like to quickly highlight a couple of points about my institute, Institute for Quantum Computing. Some of you may know it's a, a multidisciplinary center devoted for quantum information research. We work on various different technologies and also theoretical and mathematical sides. And um, probably there are some undergraduate students in the audience. Um, and they, we have a program called USKIP. It's an undergraduate quantum information program. It's a summer program. This year it happened online, but in other years, non-pandemic times, we actually invite students to IQC and this entire uh, expenses, including airfare and your uh, accommodation, plus opportunity to work in a research lab in the summer that's entirely covered by IQC. So I would encourage uh, students to apply for the USQ program for next year. Okay, so here is my very brief introduction to quantum simulation. I mean, we know from basic quantum mechanics that in quantum mechanics, we have concepts such as quantum superposition, and entanglement that we don't see in classical world. And because of those quantum effects, understanding quantum many body system is hard. 
And by quantum anybody system, I mean, you know, think about anything where you have multiple quantum degrees of freedom. You know, take water molecule, for example, you have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. So it's a quantum three body system. Um, you can go to even high energy physics and you can have, you know, this inside a collider, you have, you know, quark, gluon, plasma, very high energy events. It's a quantum anybody system, so or even a high temperature superconductor. And we believe that uh, the this very strange exotic phenomena of superconductivity at high temperature, possibly at low temperature, at least quantum effects uh, are an important effect uh, that gives rise to this kind of effect, right? This kind of phenomena. So as physicists, we, and also chemists, uh, we like to understand the many body quantum systems. The main problem is that if we want to understand such a system using normal computers, like you want to write simulations, your you know code, Monte Carlo or whatever code you want to write, often you cannot ignore the fact that in a quantum system, the Hilbert space, the number of possible quantum states that you have to deal with, that grows exponentially with the number of system. For example, if you take n two-level system or in half objects, for example, then the Hilbert space grows as two to the n exponential. So by the time you have 100 spin half particles, your Hilbert space is two to the 100, which is about 10 to the 30, and that's an enormous number. And our computers, you know, forget about laptops and desktops, even big supercomputers are not big enough to solve this problem. So of course there are you know, theorists, many body theorists who come up with very clever ideas for approximating your system. Um, and then there are lots of theoretical techniques, but if you want to understand the system in detail, especially quantum dynamics, then you can't really avoid this exponential growth of Hilbert space. In 1982, Richard Feynman um, asked this very interesting question in a you know, paper and a series of talks. And he was asking, can physics be simulated by a universal computer? We do simulations, right, in college, in research. We simulate lots of different physics. But what Feynman was thinking of is simulating the universe with its quantum laws of nature. And he was foreseeing this problem that if you want to simulate quantum using a classical computer, then you have to deal with this exponential Hilbert space. So his suggestion was maybe we can build the computer itself or the simulator itself out of quantum mechanical elements so that we don't have to encode quantum mechanics classically. And the system natively follows laws of quantum physics, such as quantum superposition, quantum entanglement, quantum evolution, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the basic idea for quantum computer and quantum simulator. And I already talked about some examples. Exactly what is a uh, use for quantum simulators? And as you perhaps know that there are many, many research groups, both in academia and industry that have been building these quantum computers and quantum simulators over the last you know, decade. Exactly what's the killer app for quantum simulator? Nobody knows yet. That is itself a field of research, but people have identified various research directions. For example, uh, you know, a very relevant problem for our society, the food problem. We want to have better fertilizers, you know, have better understanding of nitrogen fixation problem. Can we use a quantum simulator to gain more understanding so that we can improve our fertilizers? Or in a condensed matter physics language, we want to understand phase diagram of different kinds of many body Hamiltonians. And I'm going to talk about some of those here. High energy physics, we would like to understand quantum chromodynamics. And it turns out that quantum chromodynamics is actually a very hard problem, especially if you are looking at the dynamics of you know, quark and gluons. So um, can we build quantum simulators to do that? And with these understanding for um, basic many body physics, perhaps someday in the not too far future, we should be able to predict and build, discover new materials and maybe battery, maybe solve our energy problem and all. So this is there is a lot of wish list here and a lot of active field of research. But the basic idea here is we want to study a controlled quantum system to gain our understanding of many body quantum system. 
So how does a quantum simulator work experimentally? Okay, I'm an experimentalist. You can see from my you know fake background, which is my lab. So the basic idea is a quantum simulator is nothing but an experimentally extremely well controlled quantum system. Okay. For example, here I am showing part of the apparatus in my lab, which is a uh, it's a it's a device where, that we can use to trap individual atoms. These are ions, charged atomic ion, ions. And these ions form this nice linear chain. And as I said before, each blob come, of light comes from a single ion. The temperature is extremely low, so we can talk about quantum mechanics here. And if you look at each individual ion, it has different energy structures, right? like electronic structures and hyperfine structures and so on and so forth. So we can encode quantum information in two or more of those structures. Conventionally, people have been focusing on quantum bits or qubits, that means two level system, but more generally you can expand that to what is known as qubits or d-level systems. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on qubits. So you have two energy levels and call one of the energy levels spin down, one spin up, in quantum computation language, sometimes you call state zero, this one you call state one, it's the same thing, quantum two-level system. The fact that my system is very controlled, it means that by you know, shining these ions with appropriate electric fields and your laser radiations, we're gonna come to that in, uh, in the next section, we can actually uh, simulate or engineer different kinds of Hamiltonians for these systems. For example, this is a very well-known Hamiltonian in the condensed matter community. This is known as the transverse field Ising model or quantum Ising model. It's a simple model which shows very rich phenomena, rich many-body phenomena. For example, it shows uh, quantum phase transitions, and depending on the sign of the interaction, it can show frustration and lots of different physics. So we can engineer, we can program this system to follow these quantum phenomena. We can initialize the system and then we can just let it evolve, right? And when we say we let it evolve, all we have to do is just, we just shut down all environmental uh, bad perturbations, meaning something that measures the quantum system and therefore destroys the quantum state. The system undergoes quantum evolution. It is a quantum system, so I don't have to tell it how to follow Schrodinger's equation. It just does, it's a quantum system. And when we are, we after we wait, and when you want to know What's the answer, let's say, of the quantum state after a certain time, we um, actually shine another laser beam, very precisely tuned in frequency, such that we read out the state, the projected state in the same basis. And we can tune our laser beams in such a way that if an ion is in state up state, up spin or state one, it actually fluoresces light. And if it's in state down, then it does not fluoresce light. So you can you know, sign some light and take a picture, you know, simple, take a picture on a camera, and you, you might see something like this. First ion is bright, and the second is dark, and then bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. And uh, effectively, this means your spin system is up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, which is an antiferromagnetic spin order. And of course, it's a quantum system, so you, you cannot be done with measuring it once. You repeat it many, many times, build up statistics, and then you learn about the system. Trapped ions are one of the major um, hardware platforms for both quantum computation and quantum simulation. But of course, there are many other platforms and you have learned about some of those in this um, series of talks. Uh, for example, neutral atoms could be bosons, fermions in uh, optical potentials, superconducting circuits, uh, Rydberg atoms that can be controlled using optical tweezers, uh, photonic networks, lots of defect centers in solid state systems, they can all be used for both computation and simulation. So uh, with that, let me pause here and see if there are questions on this very basic idea of what a quantum simulator is. Um, can I ask a question? Please, yeah. Uh, so you know, what if, if you have a quantum system uh, whose mapping to spins is, let's say, non-local and extremely complicated. Then, uh, so what, what I understand is it's easy for, I won't say easy, it's still very, very difficult, but it's like direct for you to think of simulating a system which is like a spin chain and then engineering interaction. 
but imagine that you are trying to simulate fermions using spins that's a very complicated problem even mathematically so yeah. how complex is that when you try to really experimentally realize it is it yeah. possible at all and yeah yeah that's so that's 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 an excellent question in indeed indeed uh, it is hard so for example if you want to simulate you know fermions using you know transformations you can write it in spins but the main challenge there is is not really the encoding the information part but the challenge here is encoding the or simulating the unitary evolution right because when you do those transformations you have non local i think that's what you're pointing out you have non yes yes yeah absolutely yeah that's right. so uh, i would say um, we probably would not attempt to solve that problem in an analog fashion by analog fashion i mean i just I see, you know, I see. tune my thing such that that is the hamiltonian however uh, i think i'll show this in later but what yeah. what what we will do is we'll digitize that hamiltonian the unitary time evolution and break that unitary evolution in terms of bunch of single and two qubit quantum gates and oh, then very interesting I, i got the point i got my answer thank you yeah thank you in fact people have done that people have simulated uh, just a small system but people have already mm -hmm. simulated mm -hmm. yeah. interesting okay all right thanks for the question and please ask questions um i i would enjoy if this is a discussion rather than a one way talk so anything else all right um Sorry, I see someone. Is there another talk? Another question? Okay. So um, let me move on to the next part, which is uh, it's a little bit giving you a flavor. As an ex I'm an experimentalist, so you know I like showing pictures, um, and um, it's giving you a little bit of flavor of how do we even trap and control these ions. Ions are charged particles, and it's basic electrostatics that you cannot trap. a charge particle in 3d space by using only static fields right it's very simple because you cannot create a situation where uh, the electric field uh, terminates at a given point in space in all three directions that will violate gauss's law so that doesn't work so how can we trap a charge particle in 3d space uh, actually wolf kang paul came up with the idea of using time dependent radio frequency fields and uh, he got nobel prize for it the basic idea is instead of using static fields alone you use time dependent fields so oscillating fields here is a very simple example for an ion trap you have uh, you know this elect these are just conducting electrodes made of you know tungsten you can make out of steel stainless steel or whatever any conducting system will do so you have those rods and you apply voltages and these voltages are oscillating at frequencies omega which for trapped ions typically is in tens of megahertz so it's radio frequency and then uh, you want to confine in this z direction axial direction using static voltage so what's going on if you take just a snapshot of the potential as seen by the ion it has confining uh, along some direction in a, in this case it will be confining along z and then it will be anti confining along the other directions but then because it's oscillating what happens is the direction of confining and the anti confining quickly switches back and forth and you have to make sure that the potential switches back and forth faster than the time scale or the motion for the particle right and if that is the case any time the particle wants to fall down the hill the potential switches its sign and now it you know bounces it back and therefore the particle never leaves if you go to youtube you can search for mechanical analog and you can search for rotating saddle and you will see how you can um, take a saddle like in the horse back and you can uh, stabilize a a ping pong ball on a saddle if you start rotating the saddle it's the same physics here so in fact you can build one very easily using you know very simple things like razor blades i know this is i'm just showing this as a demo we built for undergraduate students in our lab it's effectively a bunch of razor blades we hook up them with the you know wall power after amplifying so wall is an oscillating signal is 60 hertz here in canada 50 hertz in india and then you have you know this standard you know, uh, the clips the pins and you apply some voltages and then you can trap some well these are not atoms but these are dust particles you know take some dust particles you can even have fine uh, tea particle or coffee particle and you can rub it in a cloth and then they become charged you can drop it and those charged particles are just trapped there they're they're trapped now they're levitated 
I even have a, a, a video here that I want to kind of sorry. Oops. Can show here. So you can see those uh, those particles. In fact, you can see them them moving back and forth, right? So what's happening here is the particle tries to leave um, because of you know force fields have to go somewhere, and then the potential changes sign and just pushes it back. So that's what's happening. Now in our lab, of course, we um, we build systems which are slightly more sophisticated because you want to do uh, quantum physics with it. But the basic idea is still the same. You have these four rods and you apply voltages. Now this whole thing has to be done inside ultra high vacuum because you know we are talking about single atoms. We don't want surrounding atoms and molecules to, to kick the atoms out from this trap. And um, yeah, so this thing is, this has a pressure of 3E minus, you know, few, 10 to the minus 11 millibar, which is ultra low vacuum. It's, you know, more, better vacuum than most empty space in, in the solar system. So you have to work to get, get to that point. And what we can do is inside this vacuum chamber, we will have a little bit of material that we want to trap. In the in our case, it's ytterbium atom, ytterbium ion, um, and, and we create an confining potential here. It's the same uh, ion trap, but looked from the side. So you can see the two needles here and the rods here. Um, this is a very simple ion trap, but of course there are much more complicated ion traps that you can make. In fact, uh, quantum ion that uh, Professor Das talked about that um, my group is building in collaboration with Professor Crystal Franco's group at Waterloo. We are using this complicated trap, which has 100 electrons. This is microfabricated, made by the Sandia National Lab in the US. So how do you trap ions? First, we make sure that, you know, we have, we apply all the voltages, your static voltages and the radio frequency voltages. These are, you know, hundreds of volts. And then I mentioned inside this needle, we have a little bit of material. Ytterbium is a metal, it, you know, it doesn't oxidize, it's, it's a very nice metal. And you send some current through it and that heats up, joule heating, to maybe a few hundred degrees Celsius, right? And because the pressure outside is so low, much lower than the vapor pressure of ytterbium, some ytterbium starts coming out, neutral atom, and they go through the center of the trap. They're still neutral, so they don't see the ions. What we do is we send a laser beam which actually photoionizes this ytterbium ion. And at the same time, we send another laser beam that cools. And perhaps you have already seen this, that you can use laser beams to cool an object. And to cool such a tiny object like a single atom or single ion by now, from few hundred degrees Celsius, the temperature of the oven, to sub millikelvin, it takes only a matter of seconds. You know, faster than a second, the atom is cold, now it has such a low kinetic energy and you have created a confining potential near the center that it cannot escape. So it's stuck there, right? And we keep more atoms coming and photoionization. So this is almost real time video actually. You would see on your camera, if you're looking into the system, uh, the atom emits scatters light from this laser cooling beam and your camera can image and you will see this one, two, three, four, five number of ions popping up. You, you know, decide how many atoms you want to work with depending on the physics you want to study, and then you just turn off the photoionization beam, turn off the atomic oven, and you're stuck with those. These ions stay for really long. For example, a single ion, a like single atom, stays in our trap for you know, weeks. And the longest we have had is almost six months. So think about that. A single atom stays in a 3D space for six months there. And you can control the distance between them by changing the voltages. And there you go, you have single atoms. Uh, this is just a you know a bigger picture of the apparatus. As I said, you need to go to very low vacuum, ultra high vacuum. For for these, you need to use vacuum technology. So students who work on in this area, you know, they have to think about lots of different things, not just quantum physics, but also you know vacuum technology, mechanical, electrical, and all sorts of stuff. And this is a slightly bigger picture of the lab. You see, this is where the ion trap is surrounded by magnetic field coils. We need to apply magnetic field for you know, atomic spectroscopy. And then you're, you're collecting a little bit of light through a microscope objective. The light is bent onto a camera and a photomultiplier tube inside this black box. And this is the detector, essentially. So, um, and you need to make sure that the lab is, you know, very nice quality and uh, 
temperature doesn't drip because the lasers are not going to be happy if things drip. So that's my second section, which was just a bunch of pictures with trapped ions. But uh, let me see if there are any questions on how do you trap ions and all. Uh, maybe I have a question. So yeah. these are mostly electrical traps and uh, are there role of magnetic field like uh, in trapping them? So let's say if mm -hmm. the spin is in the game, then do you also bring in <laughs> magnetic fields? So glad that you asked this question. That was, that's a very nice connection to my next part. But uh, to give you a, 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 just a quick answer, uh, the trapping is done electrically. By, by this oscillating electric field. There is another kind of trap though. If you search the literature, it's known as a penning trap, P-E-N-N-I-N-G. -N -N yes, yes, yes. And uh, in penning trap, what you do is you, of course, use static field and the anti-confining effect of the static field um, is overcome by applying a huge magnetic field. So whenever the charged particle oh, tries to just go away from your uh, trapping region, the magnetic field bends it back. So nice. you can you can have nice, large, two-dimensional crystal. Now, the problem with that trap, why it's not as popular as this radio frequency ball traps, is that you know because it's, it relies on Lorentz force, the force is only active when the particles are moving, right? D cross B. Yes. And, the, yeah. and that means the whole iron chain, iron crystal, actually rotates. So mm -hmm. those are very useful, but then it's a little challenging to work with them because you know your ions are not fixed in space. So you can work on it kind of stroboscopically and not in continuous time. But um, there, there are very, very impressive experiments. If you are interested in NIST, uh, Boulder has some really impressive experiments on penning trap. Now, the other part of your question, when spins are involved, in fact, just a one-line answer to that is we use light to simulate magnetic field. And there are many reasons of why we do that. And I'll come to that in the next sections. But we don't use magnetic field for happening here. Nice, nice, okay. Yeah. And is there any chance that the quadrupolar magnetic fields also find their way into trapping? Or this, you, you said, I think what it looks like is that you said a steady magnetic field will do the job if it's huge. It's almost like Hall effect that it, the charged particles will rotate yeah. and then stay there. But if you mm -hmm. probably put higher multiple multipolar fields, then it might have interesting effects which will overcome this. Uh, <laughs> It's just a thought, I mean, yeah. Yeah, possibly. I haven't thought about that, but possibly, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, because you asked about magnetic field, just want to clarify one thing. You see these coils that produce magnetic fields? Those are not to simulate the magnetic field that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Those coils are simply so that I can use different atomic lines and, you know, shift those lines by Zeman FX and all. So I I'm going to talk about magnetic field, but that will be simulated by laser. I'll make it clear. All right, so um, let's talk about ions as a platform for quantum computation or simulation. So I have been using the word computation and simulation rather loosely. The main distinction here, actually there isn't too much of a distinction from an, as an experimentalist as far as trapped ions are concerned, but there is a conceptual distinction. A quantum computer means you should be able to run any quantum algorithm on this machine, right? Could be factorization algorithm, could be search algorithm or any algorithm or Hamiltonian. Whereas a simulator is basically a, a restricted computer that you have built to solve a set of problems. So this computer may not solve everything under the sun, but it will solve a few sets of problems. For trapped ions, turns out you can use the machine both as a computer and as a simulator. So there's not much of a hardware difference. But for some other systems, for example, in a neutral atoms in optical lattices, that's a natural simulator for certain kind of bosons or interacting fermions but it's very hard to build a universal quantum computer out of those, although there are many groups that are now trying and making some impressive progress on that as well. So why ions? Now, one thing, it's very simple, but it's quite profound, is that ions are nature-made qubits. That means all qubits or all spins are identical, right? And if you contrast that with other platforms, for example, um, you know, superconductors or quantum dots, those are man-made qubits. And you know, no matter how hard you try, there will be a little bit of manufacturing imperfections between neighboring qubits. 
which might actually be the limiting factor in a quantum processor. Um, of course, it's getting better and better, but trapped ions are all natural. All interbium ions inside a trap or even a trap in India as in Canada, they're all the same, all interbium ions. And it's very easy to shield these ions. I showed you that inside the vacuum chamber is far from all sorts of you know, noises and light and you know, no atoms colliding, knocking them off. So as a result, you can actually have a really, really long coherence time, which is roughly how long you can keep a quantum object quantum, essentially, loosely speaking, right? So for example, I'm showing a paper here, recent paper from January this year, but they showed that you can uh, store quantum information in a single interbium ion for over an hour. I mean, that is really impressive. That means you create a quantum superposition of, let's say, your zero plus one by root two, and then you know you go do your you know, shopping and groceries and come back and your system is still quantum. That means nobody in this universe has still measured the system accidentally. You know? So what that essentially means that the systems are very promising for scaling up. However, I should also mention that this one hour does not mean we are at a point now where we can actually run quantum algorithms that's as long as an hour. And the reason is the moment you want to do something more interesting than just you know storing a quantum information, such as you want to build up entanglement and you know solve some interesting problem, you have to bring in classical controls. For example, you need to bring in your lasers, you need to you know change your magnetic fields and change electric fields. And the noise in those controls are the noises that's going to reduce this coherence time drastically. So in most practical experiments, uh, the coherence time the, the, the effective coherence time in the presence of all the controls is reduced to a mere you know tens of milliseconds um, but it's not it's it's not a really bad news because since your qubits are so pristine you know these electronics and lasers and all are getting better every year so you can make your system better and better with proper engineering over the last you know half a century or so there have been tremendous progress in atomic physics techniques amo atomic molecular and optical physics techniques. Part of that has to do with you know, the invention of better atomic clocks and which is onboard GPS systems why your Google map works and why it's so precise with the GPS on. So a lot of those AMO techniques can be used with these trapped iron quantum computing systems. For example, optical pumping, which is essentially a technique with which you can polarize the system to spin down or you can um, initialize the qubit to spin zero with really impressive perfection or fidelity. Uh, you can also use AMO techniques to measure the qubit as I briefly alluded to in the beginning. For example, you just shine some light and if the spin is in up state or qubit is in one state, same thing, then you just see that atom fluoresce. And if it's in zero state, it does not fluoresce. So the measurement is as simple as taking a picture. And using all of these techniques, people have demonstrated really impressive uh, state preparation errors. For example, uh, Lucas Group at Oxford is kind of a leader in doing some of these very impressive uh, quantum gates um, with this precision, like 99.9999% uh, fidelity, which is uh, how good your quantum gate is, a single qubit. And two qubit gates are slightly worse, but still it's 99.9%. In fact, these numbers are getting so much better that I envision that in the next decade or so, or five, 10 years, you would see a lot more experiments that are talking about or you know close to quantum error corrections, which is kind of this holy grail of quantum computation where um, you, your quantum system basically becomes mature enough that you can start talking about universal quantum operations uh, in a true computing sense. So, um, okay. Now, how do we manipulate single spins, right? And this is, um, the answer to the previous question. If you look at the encoding, it's basically two electronic states. Now, different ions will have different encodings. I have chosen ytterbium. That's the one we use in our lab and is used in many labs around the world. So ytterbium, even though it has, uh, it's an atomic number of 70 and mass number of 171, but its atomic structure is remarkably simple. It's actually almost like hydrogen atom. It has hyperfine states, and those hyperfine states are separated by about 12.6 gigahertz in frequency, which is a nice frequency that you can work with in the lab. Um, and you encode basically these two 
spin states or qubit states in these two hyperfine states. So you can bring in a microwave at that 12.6 gigahertz and directly induce a two spin coupling like a Rabi flopping. In our lab, for reasons that will be clear in the next few slides, uh, what we do and you know what's again done in most iterbium ion labs is instead of using a microwave, we use two laser beams. Of course, the frequency of laser beam is much, much more than the hyperfine. This is not to scale. You know, this, this is an optical frequency, 10 to the 15 hertz, and the hyperfine is only you know, tens of mega gigahertz. So this is a huge not to scale. But what you can do is you can tune the frequency difference between these two laser beams such that the beat note frequency matches your uh, qubit resonance frequency. And if you do that, you can sort of transfer the population using this lambda, three-level lambda system without ever populating the p-half state because there is a huge detuning here. Your laser is not directly exciting your atom to the p-half, but it's using this p-half state as, a, as an intermediary to transfer the population to spin up. So with that, um, here's a very simple experiment. It's, a, it's an undergraduate, first year undergraduate quantum experiment, but it's so beautiful I want to explain it again here. So this is what we are doing. We have a single ion and we prepare uh, this quantum state in state zero, which um, again, I haven't described how we do that, but we can do that with very high uh, probability. And then we turn on these lasers, right? So this is the same laser. You have lasers coming from these two sides, U1 and U2. And you tune the frequency difference to be exactly the difference between the two spin states. And we try to keep this laser on for some time tau. We wait for some time and then we do a measurement. Again, measurement means just shine some light. And if it's bright, it's spin up or state one. If it's dark, it's state zero. And then this is one experimental shot. And then the you know, next experimental shot, I'm going to increase this tau time. And this is, I'm plotting those experimental shots, single shot experimental measurements, x-axis is time, tau in microseconds here. And y-axis is what am I gonna get? What's the probability in state one and zero, right? So I'll pause for a few seconds and uh, let you think, what do you expect? This is a quantum experiment. Um, what do you expect here? So, this is what we expect as well. The first data point is already here because we prepared the system in zero, right? So your state is zero. As we increase tau, we expect this. So this is real data uh, taken at University of Maryland. This is old data. Uh, I was a student there a long time back. So, so what's happening here? It's a single shot measure in quantum mechanics. There's nothing in between. If you if your eigenstates are you know zero and one, you are only going to measure zero and one. But you see, if time tau is small, you are almost always measuring zero. And then there is at some time, you see your system is fluctuating quite a bit. Sometimes you are measuring zero, sometimes ones, zero, one, lots of fluctuations. And then at some point you are only measuring one. Then again, lots of fluctuations, and then measuring zero fluctuations, and so on and so forth. Right. So. This is what you get if you do single shot measurements of quantum. But of course, now we can repeat this experiment. That's what these you know, two dots mean many, many times. And for each time tau, I make an average of hundreds of experiments and I make an average of zero and one. And this is what you get. So this flop, this is known as the Rabi flopping. Essentially, this is average of many zeros and ones, right? So what you see here is the you know, probability is very high that your system is zero. At some point, it's 50-50, and then goes to one and comes back and forth. And these trapped ion systems, the system can oscillate between the two states for a really, really long time. If you stop at a certain time, in this case, you know, around what 35, 40 microseconds, then the probability of getting zero and one are exactly equal, 50%, and the quantum state is zero plus one by root two. This is what you call your basic single qubit quantum gate or Hadamard gate. Similarly, you can you know, build the other quantum superposition here of a single qubit. And you can actually run this many, many, many times, this flopping. All you have to do is keep this laser on, right? Now, also from very basic quantum mechanics, you know that if you have a spin in a magnetic field, the quantum mechanical description of that system is the spin precessing. So essentially, even though there is no real magnetic field, that's exactly what's happening. 
your spin, now we are talking about block sphere, like this two level system, is actually precessing between spin down and spin up, south pole and north pole of the block sphere. And the speed of precession is this Rabi frequency, which is controlled by how intense my laser beams are. If I turn off the laser beam, the precession stops. So effectively, by just shining this laser, I have simulated an effective magnetic field, which couples to the spin. And I can choose the exact trajectory of the block sphere by choosing the phase of this big node. So that's phase phi, which essentially controls which direction this simulated magnetic field is applied to. And the strength is controlled by the intensity of light. And why we do it this way? Because now the magnetic field, I can actually switch on and off and change the magnitude very, very fast. You may know that changing magnetic field is very hard because you, know, you have eddy currents and all of those things. But switching light on and off is really fast. You can switch light in hundreds of nanoseconds. So now you can probe phenomena, dynamical phenomena, where your magnetic field is rapidly changing, for example, without ever using a real magnetic field. So um, let me pause here. Does that answer your question, uh, Professor Das? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, yeah, absolutely yeah. it does. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so that's about single qubit physics. Uh, is there any question up to this point? I'm gonna go to how we can simulate uh, two ion interaction next, but if there is any question, please ask. Okay, so now the harder part, okay? So I showed you this Hamiltonian, which is a quantumizing model. You have magnetic fields along the Y component of the spin, and then you have the spin-spin interaction, the Ising interaction. Um, this I already showed, you just turn on the laser beam where the bit node is tuned to the frequency difference between your spin up and spin down, and effectively you simulate a magnetic field. The Y means you have chosen the phase of the beat node properly so that you are controlling uh, the block sphere trajectory. Okay, nice. This one is harder because this involves uh, two spins at the same time. The sigma x is just polymetric, and the spin is h bar over two multiplied by the polymetric, of course. J is the coupling. But let's look a little in a little bit detail of what, what do we mean by uh, this kind of interaction? Well, we know from uh, basic stat make that if you have this classicalizing system, just two spins, let's say, depending on the sign of this coefficient, if J is negative, that means your spins will prefer to align because that's the lowest energy. If J is positive, then the spins will prefer to anti-align, right? So the lowest energy state here for negative J is a ferromagnet, and the lowest energy for positive J is going to be some kind of anti-ferromagnet. If you have long range interaction, then the story could be slightly more complicated, but at two, uh, two spin picture, that's the picture. So, so we want to simulate the same thing for ions. Now, how do ions interact? You probably think, okay, it's Coulomb interaction because ions are charged particles after all. Yes, it's Coulomb interaction, but the Coulomb interaction in itself is not very useful because Coulomb interaction only depends on charge. It does not depend on the spin state, whether it's in up or down. So somehow we have to preferably create an energy difference between spin up, up, and down, down. How can you do that? One possible way is this. I'm not showing you how we do that, but if we could do this on this slide, then we have achieved this Hamiltonian. So wh what is the trick? Let's say we find a way to physically push my spin up in the direction down, and whenever the spin is in down, then it gets pushed up. If I could do that, I'm not telling you how we do that yet, I'll show that in the next slide, but if I can do that, then effectively, if the two ions are in spin up, up, they are both pushed downwards, but, but look at that, their separation is still the same because they're both going down, right? If they're both spin down, down, then they're both pushed up, but their separation is exactly the same again. But if one is up and one is down, now one is pushed down and one is pushed up in space. So now the energy, the Coulomb energy is now a little bit lower because now they are separate farther from each other. Similarly, if it's down and up, again, the energy is a little bit lower. So if we could indeed create what we technically call a spin dependent force, such that in real phase, how the ions are pushed is dependent on its spin degrees of freedom, 
then we have actually achieved a Hamiltonian of this form. How do you do that? Well, let's look at an atom. An atom, its wave function is localized. It's at low temperature, so there is some de Broglie wavelength. There may be a little bit of in a thermal motion too, but this, um, if you cool it properly, then the wave function is only a few nanometers wide. But the laser beam uh, has a intensity of light. It, uh, electric field, it changes it on the order of the wavelength of light, which is hundreds of nanometer. So that means within one um, atomic, you know, where the atom is, there is a gradient of the laser intensity. This is not the case if you just apply a microwave <clears throat> to flip the spins, as I said before, because micro's wavelength is longer, but that's just for comparison. So now imagine this situation. We have two laser beams, one from left and one from right. They are exactly the same frequency. So we know they're going to produce a standing wave. So you have a standing wave of intensity and the ion is here. We're going to use an effect from atomic physics known as a AC start shift. You probably have, you know, many of you are I'm sure familiar with start shift. You have apply an electric field and the atomic energies change. AC start shift is electric field, which is oscillating such as in a laser, right? Now property of the AC start shift is different levels changes energy in different directions. For example, state zero could be changing uh, its electric field in some direction, it, uh, its energy may be lowered with increasing uh, intensity, and spin one can do the exact opposite. In fact, it does in our system. So now we know that the force is a negative gradient of the potential. That means if I have an ion here, if it's in spin down, it's gonna be pushed in one direction just because of the gradient, but if it's in spin up, it's going to be pushed in the other direction. And that means, I manage to modulate my Coulomb interaction conditioned upon the spin configuration. And this is exactly like, you know, how you get exchange interaction between electrons in a solid. Here, we are getting an effective exchange interaction by, uh, by the spin dependent force, okay? So this results in the sigma z, sigma z kind of interaction. Now for um, practical reasons, we actually don't like sigma z, sigma z interaction. Instead, what you do is we, again, do a little bit of frequency difference between the two lasers, nu1 and nu2, such that the standing wave is now moving. It's changing in frequency at the beat node frequency, nu1 minus nu2, because that gives us another control knob. So what kind of control is this? We can tune this beat node frequency to excite the motional modes, collective motional modes of these ions. So this is going to be my kind of last major concept here. I think I'm, I'm 10 minutes left, is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so motional modes. We know that if you have, you know, some um, oscillators, classical particles, could be pendulums or you know uh, masses connected by springs, then there are certain normal modes of motions where the whole system oscillates at a specific frequency, like with some pattern. If you take a bunch of Coulomb particles in one line and we consider the motion in the transverse direction. The highest frequency normal mode is the central mass mode, and they move like this. The next frequency, the next lower frequency is the tilt mode, so where the ions that are at the edge move the largest, and the center ion you know, doesn't move much. If it's odd number of ions, it doesn't move at all. And then similarly, there are other normal modes, you know, n number of normal modes in any direction. So, now let's go back to this picture again, where we are shining these two laser and we are controlling the frequency difference between those two lasers. So in addition to changing the spin state, we can also change, we can also excite these normal modes of motion. And this normal modes of motion means exactly we are creating a spin dependent force. It's an oscillatory force, but it's a spin dependent force nevertheless. And the effect of that, I'm skipping a few steps here, but the net result of that is I have control over the spin-spin interaction. And kind of hand wavy and intuitively, you can understand that how neighboring spins are going to interact or you know, next neighbor is going to interact will depend on the nature of the motion of the normal mode that I'm using to mediate this spin-spin interaction. For example, if you're considering the center of mass mode, where all the ions are moving together, there's no concept of who is nearest neighbor and who is farthest neighbor, right? So in effect, I can simulate an interaction which is infinite range interaction. Like it doesn't decay at all. Similarly, if I go, uh, so if, what, 
all we are doing is just changing the frequency of this laser, which is really easy to do in the lab. But I tune close to the next normal mode, where it's the tilt mode. Then what happens is the ions that are farthest apart from each other, they are interacting with the strongest force. So it's an interaction that I'm simulating that actually grows with distance rather than falling off with distance. Similarly, if I go in between other modes near, you know, other normal modes, the shape of the, the spatial shape of the interaction pattern depends on uh, the nature of the normal mode. Okay. So we can make it a lot more complicated. In fact, a lot of current generation experiments, including uh, including the ones that we are building at Waterloo, are going towards you know this fairly complicated optical uh, technology, optical architecture. And the idea here is now we want to have full control over that interaction graph. So how do you get full control? Instead of sending one big fat laser beam, we actually send individually focused laser beams. Further, each laser beam has multiple frequencies so that we can excite these normal modes. Coherently, we can excite those normal modes in a selective way, controlled way. And if we do that, then in fact, we have full control over the entire Ising coupling matrix, JIJ matrix. It has you know, n choose two or roughly n square over two controls and we have more than that control parameters. So let me show you just one slide on what sorts of fascinating physics you could do if you gain full control over a spin network. You can dynamically change the interaction graph. When we talk about, let's say, you know, understanding spin dynamics on a Kagome lattice, which is this lattice, whether a lattice is Kagome or not, it really is given by how the spins are interacting with each other. So even if my ion chain is a one dimensional physical ion chain, ion chain, and I don't need to rearrange my ions in a Kagome lattice, but if I can control the pairwise interaction, then I can indeed simulate this system. And by changing this pairwise interaction, again, changing frequency of a laser beam, which can be done extremely fast in a lab, I can go to this lattice. So it opens up lots of different simulation possibilities. And you know, uh, many body physicists in the audience encourage you to, I encourage you to you know, think about what we can do with such possibilities. You can even think of within the same experiment, dynamically change the lattice pattern, you know, go from one lattice to other and come back go from you know, frustrated system to non-frustrated and come back and all. We can do that experimentally. Um, this is work in progress, but you will see a lot more of this in the next few years from various groups. So um, when we when we were looking into um, how we can engineer this spin-spin interaction, we realized even before we talk quantum, there is a very hard classical problem, which is I showed you how we can shine different lasers on different ions to create this spin-spin interaction in the last couple of slides. But the reverse problem is fairly hard. So let's say, you know, what your theorist in the audience tells me, okay, solve this problem, spin problem on this lattice, this Kagome lattice. So that means I need to know how I tune my laser beams, both intensity and frequency, so that all of those phonon-mediated interactions add up coherently to create exactly the interaction pattern that I want. So this direction is very hard, like finding the exam experimental parameters. It's a nonlinear optimization problem. I don't have time to go into detail, but this is one example where actually uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning helps in, um, in finding the solution. What we can do is we can create lots and lots of different configurations for um, laser beam power and frequency, computing the Ising Coupling pattern is trivial. It's just one line of arithmetic here, right? So I can create 100,000 different cases and now let a neural network pick the pattern between those 100,000 cases. And if it's trained properly, this is a work in collaboration with Roger Melko, you can look at this recent publication. If it's trained properly, then next time I want a very specific interaction pattern, I just ask my neural network and you predict, program your system simulator this way, and this is what you get. So I think that's uh, all I have. This is, um, okay, this is my very last slide, I think, which is there are two different ways, and I, I think I talked about this in response to Professor Das's question in the beginning. There are two different ways you can run a uh, quantum simulator normally. One is the analog way, where you exactly fine-tune your Hamiltonian, such that you know there is no trotterization. In continuous time, you're simulating a system. But sometimes it's not possible. For example, if you're simulating interacting fermions, it's not possible because you don't have interacting fermions. So you can break down the unitary evolution into smaller quantum gates, single qubit and two qubit, and then in discrete time steps, 
we can simulate the system. Digital quantum simulation is universal, owned by, um, I think, 1997, Seth Lloyd showed it in a seminal paper. Um, but, uh, but analog simulators are always a little bit easier for experimentally. So in the past five years, and even now, many of the experiments are focusing on analog, but you will see more and more digital in the future. In my group, we are also interested in something in between. I won't have time to time to go into detail, but you can actually mix certain properties of analog simulations with digital to do lots of interesting things like a hybrid simulation. And if you're interest, interested, please go through um, this look at this paper where we talk about how to simulate a 2D spin system using a 1D system in a hybrid way. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think I'm out of time. Uh, I'm going to skip this session. And uh, I think that's it. So in summary, I showed that trapped ions are a versatile platform for quantum simulation. And uh, if we could have the ability to manipulate you know, individual ions, then you can create lots of interesting, that is geometries, you can use machine learning. And uh, you know, I didn't show here, but um, as uh, Professor Das said in the introduction, that we are actually building an open source quantum computer. What this means is that you, know, you theorists, uh, without knowing anything about lasers and you know, trapped ions, or without knowing much about them, you can actually use a quantum computer remotely you know, through a desktop, uh, through the cloud, an actual machine to solve your problem. And we are building it for the research community, academic community. We are hoping that in the um, you know, next year, hopefully there will be a limited version available. So thank you very much. And I'm open to take any questions. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really pedagogical. It built from scratch, showed us beautiful, nice experiments which undergrads can connect to. And, you know, you finally brought it to the highest level. Wonderful talk. I mean, really, really, really nice. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. Any questions? Please unmute yourself and ask. No questions. How does the phase of the laser beam control the motion of the iron? Uh, so I can please repeat the question. How does the phase of the laser beam control the motion of the iron? Right. So let me think. Actually, we don't. Okay. No. So so yeah. There, there is a straight answer to that question, which is. Uh, so, so basically what you are doing here is these two laser beams in the opposite direction. Uh, it's creating a beat note, right? So if you think of uh, like a harmonic oscillator and you are driving the harmonic oscillator in a, like a driven fashion. So it's the beat note between the two lasers that is essentially driving your ion. So if you change the phase between the two lasers, you change the phase of the driving. Because as you know, if you're driving an oscillator, the oscillator locks to the drive frequency, right? So it's the f that's how the phase of the laser and when you track uh, controls the driving. And when you translate that into the spin-spin interaction, where that phase writes, and, and this is something that I totally um, you know, did not explain in the talk, is this suffix. You see it's X, right? You can ask why is it X, why not Y? And why is it not you know, X plus Y? That is precisely controlled by the phase of the laser beam. So thanks for the question. Any other questions? Um, uh, if not, maybe I have a question. So I think what you told us is you can convert the mechanic. If you can control the mechanical motion of your atoms, then you can control the interactions. So you find a way of uh, optically controlling the mechanical motion, which converts into the interaction as you desire. Is that correct? And that can be super fast. Exactly. And that is quite interesting because, you know, if you take two ions that are separated by few microns, and uh, if you look at the direct spin-spin interaction, right? So these atomic orbitals, they have a little bit of spin momentum. So there is also a direct spin-spin interaction. Right. Turns out that interaction energy is extremely low. So we, we, we like to all the energy and frequency units so just Planck's constant. You mean so, the dipolar interaction? The dipolar interaction. So dipolar interaction yeah. between ions that are separated by few microns is actually subhertz level. 
And when you are doing these experiments, you would like interactions that are as high as possible because there is a you know ticking time clock in the lab, which is you know your coherence time. And like to wrap up your entire experiment much shorter than the coherence time. Yeah. So by controlling this motion, in fact, by resonantly enhancing the mechanical motion to these you know, mechanical resonances, you are effectively increasing the interaction scale. So JIJ can be boosted up to several kilo, kilohertz, which oh, means you know, in a millisecond, sub-milliseconds, you can wrap up these experiments. I see, I see. So so the question is, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Maybe I ask after you ask. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, how did you implement the control lot? Yeah, so, right, so I did not quite uh, explain that, but let me see. So here, uh, in trapped iron, whenever, you know, whenever I talk about trapped iron gates, in most cases, people are talking about this kind of gate, sigma x, sigma x. There's a technical term for it, it's called momor Sorensen gate, named after, you know, the two Danish physicists who came up with this scheme of uh, how to generate this. So a control knot can be written as a product of single qubit gates and the momor Sorensen gate. So when we say control knot in trapped iron, we don't like do it at once. What we do is we have local single qubit gates followed by momor Sorensen, followed by another local gate, and this put together gives us a control knot. Okay, so so I think I had one more question regarding. See, I think what you are having is a linear chain of atoms, which are using to simulate depending on how you couple them, simulate, simulate one dimensional problem is natural two and three D. But the moment you go to 3D, the chain size will exponentially increase, right? To simulate it through the 1D, 1D chain. Is, is that a bottleneck for your experiment? Indeed, 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 indeed. That is indeed a bottleneck. So let me tell you why we uh, prefer uh, this. Can't you make snakes, for example? I'm just curious, aren't they? to fit in more. No, no. So there is a. So first of all, there are people who are actually working with 2D systems. Um, 2D oriented. But here is a fundamental reason why people have been avoiding 2D systems and in, in Paul traps. So I, I told you that we have to apply this oscillating field, right? And um, right, to right, right. effectively create a confining potential. So if you look at this trap, if you look at the symmetry axis going through the center, just by the symmetry of left and right, on that line, there's a line on which the amplitude of that oscillating field is almost zero. Ideally zero. Oh, I see. So we want the ions to be experiencing the potential, but we actually don't want them to be dancing. Right. The and so this so, is known as... So you're basically saying to create a equilibrium position, I mean, not equilibrium, driven equilibrium position, in a sense, driven equilibrium position. 1D is the natural thing in the lab. And then you have to find ways to make it 2 and 3. So... Uh, uh, so, so I, I, th I think you are almost there, uh, but I would not say that 1D, you cannot do 2D. So a simple way to actually do 2D crystal here is you can uh, increase the confinement in the axial direction and the chain will start buckling. It's like making a stick, as you said. <laughs> so that is indeed a stable equilibrium position. It, it's So stable in the sense, okay, stable in the sense the ions are moving, but that micro motion is small, tiny, that if you are you know, looking at this, this kind of image, you will actually not see that motion. However, when you are shining this laser, now that your eye is, you know, oscillating fast, uh, that oscillation creates modulation of the laser frequency. And that starts creating a lot of practical problems. Like, you know, see, and, see, and, and kind of another fundamental thing here is, um, if you have a driven system, it's a driven system. That means you are constantly pushing energy. Yeah. So if somehow your system finds a way to couple to a dissipative some dissipative mechanism at the driven frequency, which can happen because you know your this normal collective normal modes have some very little nonlinearity, which extends mm -hmm. all the way to the driving frequency. Mm -hmm. But then you are constantly pushing energy. So at some point you're going to heat up the system. Right, 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 right. And you also last question. You also said it can be made infinite range, as long as you as long range as you wish. What is that? I mean, that is something which was not clear. How do you make it? as desired as long range as long range as possible yeah of course there are lots of uh, terms and conditions apply there right I mean, we, so, we are really hard pressed for time but maybe just a quick remark will be very yes, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a quick remark. so so the basic idea is if you can ignore all the other modes that means you tune your laser detuning very close to the center of mass mode then indeed the interaction could be very long range the challenge here is you always have the other modes that's gonna you know conspire and coherently add up their short range pattern 
to make the range a little bit lower. In practice, in practice in the lab, you can create interactions that are of the order one over R to the alpha. Alpha in practice going from something like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, all the way to 2.5 and 3. It's a continuous very interesting. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. But, uh, okay. but you can indeed actually go to much lower alpha. I mean, there is no, no nice. like, real theoretical limit. You can go to really long interactions. Yeah. Okay. So with that, we well, thank you again for the excellent talk, really. I mean, yeah, one, totally. of the, yeah, one of the best yeah. talk I heard. One of the best talk I heard in the conference. Yeah. So with that, we close this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this talk and we move on to... So, so, Professor Panigrai, can I, I, yeah, I yeah. hand it on to you? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Rajiv. Truly illuminating talk. Very nice talk. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So I hope Kavita is in. Sorry for a few minutes of delay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. You know, see this talk went on a little longer. No so problem. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. I, <laughs> my no, apologies. For no it. issue. Sorry. And I. I Logged in earlier. Yeah, it seemed a very Rangit, nice talk. Rangit will chair the session. Rangit, please take over. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Uh, Kavita, good morning. And uh, good morning, everyone. Professor Panikrahi. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Kavita Durai from Aidar Mohali. Uh, she will be talking today on uh, quantum information using qubits and qubits with a special focus on magnetic resonance. Uh, how we use NMR nuclear magnetic resonance as a tool to realize some of the gates or mechanism or methods of quantum information. Now about uh, Kavita, uh, she did her PhD from uh, IIUC Bangalore and after that uh, she did postdoc in Germany, I think in Frankfurt and uh, in Dortmund. And later, she also uh, did another postdoc in uh, Carnegie Mellon, and finally, she joined IIT Chennai, IIT, uh, Chennai as assistant professor. And later, she moved to Aida Mohali. So right now, she is there, and she works on quantum information, and she was working on quantum information since 2000. So I'm actually her lab junior. So we are from the same lab, and I remember the, the very early activity in the lab on quantum information started with her with the realization of constant and balance function, this uh, DJ algorithm, Doyle-Zosa algorithm. So one of the first few algorithms realized by, I mean, experimentally realized, and she, she it's her work, essentially. So, I mean, she is on this uh, real, I mean, experimental realization of quantum computation. She is doing this for like 20 years. She also has other interests, I mean, using the methodology of NMR, but today we would like to listen to, I mean, listen from her about, I mean, the quantum computation using magnetic resonance. So, Kavita, yep. Yeah, thank you so much, Rangeet. Am I audible? Yes, you are, very much. We can hear you. I'm having some internet issues. Hello, am okay. I audible? Yeah, you are audible. You are audible. Maybe. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let yeah. me let me share screen now. Yes, please. Yeah. So I'm having some internet connectivity issues. So I'm not switching on my video. Um, and uh, can you see the? Yes. Yes, we can. Can see you see it. my screen? Okay. It's okay. in full screen mode. Yeah, so, we can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So, uh, first of all, it's good morning, everyone. And um, I came in at the tail end of the previous talk on um, ion traps, quantum computing. And I wish I had actually logged in earlier because it was a really interesting talk. I first of all thank the organizers, uh, especially Professor Panigrahi, for giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you in this summer school. I'm sure uh, you've all had a wonderful time uh, learning about various uh, fundamental, foundational, as well as applicational issues in this very exciting field. And I thank Rongit for his very kind introduction. Um, 
So let me begin. What I'm going to do, since I have around an hour and a half, I will begin by uh, going over some known known to you by now ground. That is, I will talk about you know what is a quantum computer, why is it so, why are people so excited about it, and uh, then come to you know a few examples of hardware realizations. Um, just a brief glimpse, and then get into the nitty gritties of you know how to build a quantum computer using NMR, that is nuclear magnetic resonance. Then I will talk about you know what really is NMR. Um, so what's the nuclear? What's the magnetic? What's the resonance part? And then how we uh, you know what are the challenges uh, that that NMR quantum computers face? What makes them unique? And um, then some of the successes of NMR uh, QC, or as Rangit mentioned, uh, this field has now been um, around for uh, for more than two decades. Uh, so there are a few uh, very interesting achievements. And then I will um, talk to you about three different directions that uh, my lab has explored, namely quantum entanglement, quantum contextuality, and quantum control, all using nuclear spins as qubits. Along the way, I'll also talk about uh, what are qubits and how, you know, um, because so far, I, I guess most of the talks that you've listened to have all been about using qubits or quantum bits, which have a logical z state zero and a logical state one. Um, but one can expand the Hilbert space um, to, to, to more than a binary logic, and that would be a qubit. So I'll also briefly touch upon that and, and show you how we used a qtrit, which was a three-level quantum system, to perform, uh, to, to implement a new kind of quantum algorithm. So, uh, yeah, and I'm from Aisa Mohali. Um, we have a nice NMR facility with two machines and with, uh, if you're an undergrad or a PhD student interested in visiting or doing a short-term project on NMRQC, please uh, email me and we can work it out. So let me begin by talking about a paradigm shift. It's, um, it's what happens when uh, a chicken emerges from an egg and actually looks at the world around. So in the 20th century, there was a paradigm shift from the classical to the quantum world. And um, in the 21st century, there was another paradigm shift, which was from classical information to the concept of quantum information and thereby quantum computing. Because of course, the real world we live in is quantum. So what really is a quantum computer? It's it's nothing but a device which uses quantum mechanics, the laws of quantum mechanics, to perform a computation. So we're all very familiar with quantum mechanics, and we're all very familiar with, quant with computing, with classical computing. And quantum computing is basically a marriage or a merger of these two concepts. Uh, of course, uh, classical computers work on binary logic and the basic bit of an information, basic unit of classical information is a, is a bit, uh, which can take the value zero or one. And so as an analog uh, or as a corollary in quantum information, one would have quantum bits or qubits. And here one would map the eigenstates of a quantum system, zero or one, or in the case of a spin half particle, spin up and spin down, and we relabel re these quantum states as um, logical zero and logical one. And um, of course, this is not the end of the story because a quantum system can exist in a superposition. It need not be um, only in this, in this eigenstate zero or the eigenstate one. Of course, if you make a measurement of the system, and that's what I've, I've shown in this little cartoon here, where there's a Schrodinger's cat which was dead or alive. The classical cat would be either dead or alive, but the, the Schrodinger cat could be in a superposition of dead and alive. And so a quantum computer, and one can think of having you know a register of such qubits, all kind of talking to each other, all connected to each other. 
and um, so one could think of having superpositions of states of many different qubits, say n qubits. And a quantum computer manipulates these states, performs the computation, and then makes a readout. And um, that's that's this that's why the speed of the quantum computer comes into play. So, what are the things that a quantum computer can do? Why is it that uh, governments and nations all over the world are pumping in so much money and effort and manpower into research in into progr making progress in this field? So the good news is that if you have n qubits, um, uh, 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 if, if a quantum computer has a register size of n qubits, it can store 2 to the power n numbers simultaneously. So 3 qubits, for instance, can store 8 combinations of 0 and 1 simultaneously. And that's you know the, the power of parallelism that is being used. That's good news. Great news, of course, is that it, this leads to super fast computational speeds. So a three qubit quantum computer can compute eight times faster than its classical analog, which is a three bit computer. So a 64 bit quantum computer can, can compute two to the power 64 times faster than the classical computer. Of course, the bad news is that a measurement always collapses this superposition, so one doesn't have all these possibilities. And the really, really bad news, the worst news possible is that there's something called decoherence, which is actually the way the system or the quantum computer interacts with its environment. And this is always there. These in such interactions, uh, whether it is of qubits or whether it is of uh, photons, they always interact with the environment and they always you know decay so quantum states which have been prepared by the experimentalists in the lab are very fragile and that means that while the computation is going on the information or what what you're trying to store even before you read it out has decayed so one can do various things one can try to protect a quantum state which i'll talk about later on in this talk uh, or one can, you know, uh, have some built-in error, error detection and error correction protocols. So there's been a lot of work in this direction. And of course, so I talked about quantum parallelism or superposition as being, uh, you know, one of the reasons why quantum computers and quantum computing is so exciting. The other, of course, is something which is intrinsically quantum, which has no classical analog. So and that is entanglement, which is, you know, posited to be at the heart of the computing speed up achieved by quantum computers. So what is entanglement? It's basically a correlation. So if one has, say, two qubits, okay, um, or in the, in the famous case of Alice and Bob and the EPR, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paradox, um, the Alice and Bob, you know, share a maximally entangled pair of qubits, wherein the measurement of one qubit is always correlated to the measurement of the other. So if Alice makes a local measurement on her qubit, she's always able to tell you what is the state of Bob's qubit. Um, there have been several milestones in quantum cryptography, quantum speed up, main, main uh, being the Shor's prime factoring algorithm. So um, as you know, I, I'm sure this has been talked about in the summer school. So the prime factoring algorithm takes, you know, finds the uh, prime factors of the integer n. And um, the classical algorithm takes exponential time. And this is the security on which most of internet finance, most banks, passwords, they all work on having this um, key. Um, and, and that's why, you know, it's so secure and it would take a hacker exponential time. So in, uh, for example, uh, if you have to find, in order to hack into somebody's bank account, if the internet robber has to find the factors of a hundred digit number, 
if that is indeed the password it would take him 14 billion years you know the age of the universe so these these uh, bank passwords are extremely secure and they cannot be hacked into but um, the idea is so it's exciting not just governments but i guess it's exciting um, uh, robbers everywhere that if you can build if they can build a quantum computer or if you can build a quantum computer then you can rob a swiss bank well that's the idea uh the third milestone or the third area or arena where quantum computers are going to make a big impact is in quantum simulation and this um, you know uh, excites lots of physicists especially low temperature and condensed matter physicists because now you have the possibility as uh, was was uh, theorized by richard feynman in 1982 way back in 1982 that why not use because you know the dimensionality of these systems is very very large so why not use other quantum systems to sort of compute um, either the ground state or the uh, energies of um, a, 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 of a quantum system of choice so um, just to get back to a few quotes by famous people um this is what feynman said that nature is in classical and if you want to simulate nature you better make it quantum mechanical and of course he was right because it is not an easy problem and even decades down the line we are sort of inching closer to building a real quantum computer but we are not quite there yet uh samuel brownstein who's also a pioneer in the field uh had a much more whimsical take on what is a quantum computer and he talks about the size so he says imagine a computer whose memory is larger is exponentially larger than its physical size a computer that can manipulate an exponential set of input simultaneously and that's what i just you know in the past couple of slides spoke about that one can have a 2 to the power n um, kind of computational power computational speed up by using n qubits and so brownstein says that this computer is a computer that computes in the twilight zone of hilbert space so of course one has to you know what, what is the model of a computer for that one needs to go back to the turing machine um by i don't know how many of you have watched a very interesting um uh, film which came out on the life of alan turing um i recommend you should watch it uh, so you know one what one does is one treats information as real and as physical so turing he first formalized a model of computation and showed that it can be made rigorous and and built or well built in 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 theoretically what is called a turing machine which kind of sets out what is a computer and what are the elements of a computation so of course the first would be to to input a state or to to initialize the machine into a state the second step would be to you know perform the computation and the third step would be to uh, sorry the third step would be to act uh, out the computation and read out the result so going back to uh, i mean this is more of the same so uh, like we discussed a qubit is a two level quantum system logical zero and logical one are mapped onto the two eigen states one can have a large quantum register so a big quantum computer of n qubits n two level systems uh, each living and and all of them live in a 2 to the power n dimensional hilbert space but this works on uh, so qubit works on binary logic that's why one has two over there uh, a qubit is on the other hand a d dimensional quantum system so d equal to 2 for a qubit and it's d equal to greater than 2 for a qubit and it's non binary logic so quantum register in this case would have d to the power n qubits as elements to perform the computation so i mean as you can appreciate that's a much larger hilbert space Uh, of course the kind of operations will have to be you know very carefully um, targeted for for such qubits 
and that's a that's a job in itself but in principle one can if one can have a qubit computer then one can also you know people have thought about it that one can also have a qubit computer maybe with different constraints so um, like i said the quantum circuit model of computation is that you prepare an input quantum state and this is usually in a pure state like you know all the uh, qubits are in the state 0 or all the qubits are in the state 1 and so on um, all evolution in uh, quantum mechanics is unitary so one then applies a set of quantum gates uh, which actually are you know I'll, I'll talk about quantum gates in a little while but uh, the one one the, so the input state or the initial state evolves under the action of these quantum gates which perform the which sort of implement the quantum circuit and then you measure the state of the n qubits uh, by measuring the output okay like i said uh, quantum mechanics evolution is unitary so then people have said that uh, the quantum gates have to work on reversible logic. So one of the earliest uh, gates was a control not gate. And what one, that does is it flips the state of one qubit conditional on the, on the state of the other qubit. So one has a control qubit and a target qubit. And you, as you can see, if the, if the control qubit is in state zero, nothing happens to the state of the target qubit. So if it is uh, uh, 0, 0, it, the state remains 0, 0. If it is 0, 1, its state again remains 0, 1. However, if the state of the control qubit is 1, then it flips the state of the target qubit. So 1, 0 goes to 1, 1, and 1, 1 goes to 1, 0. And that's the unitary uh, which corresponds to the, the 4 by 4 matrix, which corresponds to the control not gate. Um, De Vincenzo also gave a criteria for what should or how should one visualize because you know all these were theoretical ideas back in the uh, late 1990s that um, okay one can have one can use quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems one can build a quantum computer one can have gates which work on reversible logic but all of these were at the level of ideas, you know. So De Vincenzo was the first person to actually set down certain criteria, which is very important because one should have the building blocks in place and only then one can one, you know, as experimentalists begin um, sort of visualizing and building a computer. So the first, of course, is that one should have a scalable physical system which has qubits identified. Now, for, for example, the kind of uh, quantum computer that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, NMR, the qubits are identified as uh, the, the nucleus pins. Then, of course, the quantum computer should have the ability to initialize the state of these qubits, like I said, all uh, into the state 0, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. Uh, I also said that, you know, decurrence times can be, uh, decurrence can kill the quantum computation, even uh, can kill the result of the quantum computation, even before it's been read out. So this, the, the idea that, you know, the system talks to the environment and that, that information or the state is destroyed or the information that, that is encoded in the state is destroyed, that, um, it uh, doesn't happen if the decoherence time of the of the system is long enough so ideally you know naturally one should look for systems which have lo long decoherence time so that you know the gates can be operated and the readout can happen and then if the state decohers that that's fine of course in order to perform the computation one should have very precise quantum control so one should have a universal set of quantum gates and finally, one should be able to read out the result of the measurement on whichever qubit that one wants to. So that's, that is what is tomography um, or readout. I'll come back to this later. So there were several physical quantum computers that were envisaged. The first, of course, was NMR, then the ion traps, vacancy centers, polarization states of photons, superconducting qubits which is what the IBM quantum processor works on, solid state spin devices, and several hybrid models. And this is what some of them look like. So the superconducting IBM quantum processor, 
um, NMR, trapped ions, and photonics. So now I come to, you know, what is the N in NMR? This denotes nuclei. So nuclei have a certain magnetic moment, uh, which is gamma times I times H cross, I being the spin angular momentum. And one can envisage, so people have thought of the very classical picture, you know, we always need something to, some image to, to pin our thoughts about, quant about the quantum world around. So the classical picture of uh, a nucleus is like a small magnetic top, which is spinning around its axis. And if we take this picture further, and say we switch on an external magnetic field, I've denoted this by B0, acting in the positive Z direction, along the positive Z direction. Um, what happens to all these? So I have a collection of nuclear spins, okay, all spin half particles. And uh, I put them in this, and they're all, you know, spinning around their axes. And now I put them into this magnetic field, switch on the magnetic field. And what happens to the spins? They start precessing, you know. So a precession, a precessional motion, as you remember from your um, 12th class physics, is, um, is, is what gyroscopes do. So if you, if you remember your Resnick and Halliday um, problem set, uh, they, they, they kind of mutate or process around the magnetic field. And it so happens that, so all of these tiny magnets, you know, start uh, processing. And if you if you uh, add up, if, so if you think of these mu's as vectors um, and their precessional frequency, it's called the Lama frequency after the guy who discovered this. So the the Lama frequency omega is proportional to the uh, magnetic field B zero. So the higher the magnetic field, the faster these spins process, and the the uh, the the, the factor gamma is called the gyromagnetic ratio. And of course, the higher the gamma, uh, the higher the Lama frequency. And it, and if you add up all these vectors, okay, which are processing, then the final orientation along or parallel to the direction of B0 has a lower energy. And that's the ground state of this ensemble of nuclear spins. So that's what I talk call the net magnetization. Um, and so the slight, there's a slight spin excess along the B0. And uh, this happens because one can decompose the, the individual spin magnetization vectors in the Z and XY direction. And the net magnetization is aligned along with the B0. So that is the N, the nuclear, and M, the magnet. And what is the R? That is the resonance. So you again, going back to 12th class physics, you all know what is the phenomenon of resonance. You all know this classic picture of, you know, the soldiers being um, marching in step. And when they reach a bridge, uh, they're told to march out of step because it can happen that they're marching in step. If it matches the natural frequency of the bridge, then the bridge can actually break. Okay. And... Um, uh, there have been many disasters, uh, bridge disasters. You can go to YouTube and search the Tacoma Bridge disaster, which happened um, when there was a storm and the wind frequency um, actually matched the fre natural frequency of the bridge and the bridge collapsed. So, uh, well, um, coming back to less exciting things like the NMR signal. Um, so, if, if I apply... Uh, an RF um, field, okay, along, and I have called this B1, and apply it in the XY plane, okay? And uh, so I have this set of spins, and they're all processing around the magnetic field. There's a net magnetization M0 along the B0, along the Z direction. And then I apply this, this uh, B1 field in the XY plane, and what happens is that uh, these spins can actually and and if the if the resonance frequency is matched so if the frequency of the b1 field matches the lama frequency of the spins these guys can then absorb this energy and um, then they then the magnetization gets tipped to the xy plane and which can be measured 
by, by the RF coil, which I've noted in this diagram. So that really is the detection of the NMR signal. Um, and of course, you know, everything has to, so the, the of course, the MXY uh, signal, this, uh, the magnetization in the XY plane has to process back to the Z axis, has to get back to equilibrium. And while it does so, it generates a fluctuating magnetic field, so it generates a current in the coil, which is picked up and amplified, and that's what I call the receiver coil over there, because it receives the signal, and that an amplified, picked up and amplified signal is actually the NMR signal. So there's a block diagram of an NMR spectrometer. There's a superconducting magnet because these are very, very high magnetic fields of the order of Tesla that we're talking about. And uh, just to give you an idea, the Earth's magnetic field is just a few Gauss and uh, one uh, Tesla is 10 to the power four Gauss. Um, there's some very complicated RF circuitry, uh, which sends the llama the resonant frequency to the spins and then picks up the, the signal. So that is called the probe, okay? So the transmitter transmits the RF signal, the receiver receives the RF signal, and of course, one all of this is connected to the workstation, which performs the analysis of the signal. This is what an actual spectrometer uh, looks like. It's a 900 megahertz, one of the highest available magnetic fields. And this was, of course, the quantum picture, because so far we've been talking about spinning tops, but actually one has to kind of junk that picture for quantum mechanics and just think in terms of um, the states of uh, a spin particle and the energy difference between the states, which is proportional, of course, to um, gamma H cross B0. And we're talking about radio frequencies here. So for a typically a magnetic field in Tesla, the frequency of these spins, the llama frequency of these spins is in the RF range. So it's in megahertz. Of course, uh, you know, if, if this was all, if all the spins were of the same type um, and one just, you know, applied a, a, a llama frequency, picked up the signal, then one, one would get one peak corresponding to all the spins. And that really, you know, it's exciting, it's, it's fun, but it's not very interesting uh, from an application's point of view. So luckily for NMR spectroscopists, uh, what actually happens inside of these nuclei is that um, these spins don't, each spin sees a slightly different, sees or perceives a slightly different B0 field. It, what it actually sees uh, is an effective field because of the magnetic field, the intrinsic magnetic field, which is generated by the surrounding electron cloud. So the electron cloud either shields or de-shields the, the, the you know, B0 field that each nucleus sees. If there are more electrons, then there's more shielding, um, which is there. If there are less electrons, there's less shielding. And that either adds or subtracts to the field. So if uh, now we know the concept of resonance, we know the concept of llama frequency, and we know that the llama frequency is precise for every uh, nucleus. So if the, and, and it depends on the, it's uh, omega is, is proportional to gamma times, we can't do anything to gamma, but uh, omega is gamma times B. So instead of B0, if we have a B effective, and that's slightly different for each nucleus, that means that the resonance frequencies of all of the spins in a particular sample, um, in a particular NOR sample is slightly different. So if all these frequencies are slightly different, that means that if there are hundreds of spins, one would have, and they all have slightly different frequencies, in principle, one would be able to, one should be able to pick up these hundreds of different frequencies, and that would lead to hundreds of signals and, and a lot more information. So that, um, of course, that's that's because of the kind of electron cloud that, that um, uh, surrounds each nucleus. One can also have a different kind of information, uh, which is called the NOE or the nuclear overhauser effect, and that gives you distance. You know, how far away is one nucleus away uh, from the other? And um, if put in layman's terms, what happens is that if there are two spins, A and B, and if B is really close to A, 
the relaxation will be affected and and you know these guys can talk to each other depending on how close they are and that talking to each other affects the nmr signal and one is able to to um, you know estimate how far away these spins actually are one can actually um, you know get a get a picture of the internuclear distance in this case r ab so the signal that one gets by performing this kind of experiment gives one a handle on on the distance information of these spins one can also do a slightly different experiment in nmr um so for instance you know we are all made up of water we are i think 95% water and um, the idea is that if one you know has to image so one wants to pick up the signals inside your brain or inside any kind of soft tissue the first thing one would do is look at the nmr signal of the water in the brain but um, you know that doesn't have water doesn't have uh, different chemical environments so the chemical shift is the same but of course you know if you have uh, if if there's a tumor in the brain then there would be less water in it and uh, if it's if it's a uh, so so tissue contrast um, is something that one would one would like to image and how would one do that one can do that by kind of tricking the the protons the in <coughs> excuse me just <clears throat> this by tricking the protons to resonate at different frequencies and that would mean that you know we want so instead of uh, making them resonate in in frequency space at different points what we say is that let's apply a gradient along the magnetic field so along b0 let me add a, a gamma uh, times b or, or an alpha times b z okay so along the the main field and that would just like the chemical shift and the and the electron cloud added or subtracted the field and had a effective field here at each point in space wherever the field is acting in a, in a linear gradient fashion um, there could be slight the you know the the protons over there each one sees a slightly different field and since it's a slightly different field then that can be picked up by the nmr receiver as a slightly different frequency um of course all of this like i said there are hundreds of spins and then there are hundreds of lama frequencies and uh, if one had to you know uh, sit down and and record the nmr signal one by one precisely of all of these hundreds of spins that would be a very very time consuming process so uh, what would one what can one do one can perform something called a fourier transform now this is a mathematical technique which transforms information in one domain into another domain so for instance here we're talking about time and frequency time because the signal is recorded in time you know it's a decaying oscillating signal and uh, frequency because you know each spin has a particular lama frequency um, which it resonates at so the idea is that you know think of think of a piano and think of all of these lama frequencies as being the keys of the piano so if i want to look at you know uh, one spin and it's resonating at a particular frequency so i press that that uh, particular piano key and it it gives off a signal an audio signal and i record it and i say okay uh, this spin corresponds to this this key corresponds to this audio signal and so on and so forth but if i don't have the time and the patience to do that what i could do is i put my, my you know all my my entire body maybe and my hands and i press it down bang on all the keys at once and record that signal okay that then i fourier transform it and so i'm able to in in a pulsed fashion i excite all the spins so i hit all the keys i excite all the spins and then i perform this mathematical operation called a fourier transform and lo and behold what do i get i get the nmr spectrum in frequency space or i get all the keys of the all the audio signals of the um, pion so that's what i've represented here 
And RF pulse is a combination um, of a wave and a step function, and it gives a signal which is centered around the basic Lama frequency. But of course, since there are hundreds of spins, there are slightly, and they're all slightly different from the basal Lama frequency omega zero. So that is the spectrum. You can see on the left is this, this blue signal, which is a time decaying signal. It's called the FID or the free induction decay, decay because it decays, induction because it's induced in the RF coil, free because it's free. And um, then, and, and this is the combination. This is, this is equivalent to hitting all the piano keys at once. So the, uh, the resonant frequencies, have, all of them, a combination of them have been pumped into the system. And then this is the resultant signal. So it's an addition of several different decaying oscillating frequencies. And then I perform a Fourier transform. And what on, on the right uh, is the NMR spectrum. And as you can see, there are lots and lots of lines. Some of them are clumped together. Some of them are very high. Some of them are very low and so on and so forth. So. Now we come to using, now you know what, what is an NMR uh, system, what does it look like. Um, now one can you think of using uh, spins as qubits. So if one has a molecule here, I have trichloroethylene, um, which has three spin half systems. We will ignore the chlorines for the moment. And so there is one proton in red and two carbon-13 spins. And one can think of this as a three qubit molecule. So each of the spins, each of the nuclei proton carb C1 and C2 can be in the state zero uh, or one. And uh, so it's a one particular quantum state I've represented as zero one zero, which corresponds to the proton being in the up, uh, oriented in the up direction, parallel to the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, the first carbon being in the down, so anti-parallel, and the third, the second carbon being in the up position again. Okay. And one can also represent the spin half uh, a qubit or an NMR qubit as a vector on the block sphere. Block sphere, of course, construction you're all very familiar with. Um, one has to, in NMR one deals with ensembles of spins, so one has many many copies, an Avogadro number of copies of that particular spin system. So one would have ten to the power. When I say I'm working with the trichloroethylene quantum computer with three qubits, I actually mean that I have ten to the power twenty three uh, numbers of that particular three qubit quantum uh, computer. So, but this is a problem. Because in a, in a spin ensemble, I mean, I would have a pure state would be if each member is described by the same state vector. So that is a pure state. However, nuclear spins at thermal equilibrium are highly mixed. Um, so, you know, I cannot really make a pure state on an NMR quantum computer. So then, you know, that's, that's the first stumbling block that NMR spectroscopists be, uh, faced or people who work on NMR quantum computing because, oops, I mean, it's all very well. We've identified our spin system. We've, we know how to address them at, in, at the different Lama frequencies in frequency space. But oops, one cannot make a pure state. So what, do one, what does one do? How does one execute the algorithm? So... Um, you know, and that's a problem because if if I execute my algorithm on a mixed ensemble, if I say, okay, fine, I don't want, I don't care about it being in a pure state, then, you know, when I read out, I will be averaging over the ensemble and that might just totally, you know, negate the results of my computation. So it's it's washed out. I don't even know um, in, in if, if the, if the, if it was supposed to be that the computation is successful, if the uh, second spin or the second qubit is in the up state. Now I'm making a measurement, but I have 10 to the power 23 copies of that second spin. So uh, uh, in an ensemble state, some of them could be up, some of them could be down. There's, there's a particular probability for that. And then that means, you know, I, I don't know the result of my computation. So how does one deal with this? And I will talk about that slightly later. And that is by using what is called a pseudo pure state. So like I said, the nuclear spins are in a Boltzmann distribution, which has a bias towards the ground state. 
and that that was that excess magnetization m0 um, in the classical picture so what do i do i work with deviation density matrices so i make a so so say i have n qubits <clears throat> n spin half uh, nuclei i put alpha of them in a pure state okay that is the zero zero state and the rest of them uh, one minus alpha of course with uh, divided by the 2 to the power n normalization factor are in the identity state and what happens is that the identity in nmr under all the pulses under all the unitary operations under all the gates it doesn't evolve nothing happens to it so it's some it's like you know it's a background which is there and i can subtract it out because if it doesn't evolve okay fine you know it's like having a, a huge jelly which which doesn't do anything which doesn't move and and uh, there's only one small part of that jelly like substance which actually moves which actually jiggles around which actually gives me my nmr signal so i i say that okay fine i will you know focus only on that small part that alpha part of the density matrix of the entire system and ignore what happens to the i or the identity part and um, of course in nmr typical values of the alpha just a minute hello so for typical values sorry about that for typical values um, alpha is of the order of tend to the palm small number and this is why you know nmr is considered a very insensitive technique um nmr interactions can be of two types i spoke about the direct dipole dipole interaction when we talked about the noe effect and then um the electron mediated scalar kind of interaction uh, when we spoke about the electron cloud and the chemical shift so these interactions or couplings between spins uh, like i've said before can be understood as a small additional magnetic field which is generated by the spin 1 and acting on the spin 2 so the total hamiltonian has those individual zeeman terms or the lama frequency terms as well as this interaction or talking between the uh, qubits kind of terms so that's how i've represented the single qubit hamiltonian so so I say i have um and so i have the lama frequency um and then of course i add the oscillating rf in the xy plane uh, and that is the second that's represented as the second term that gives rise to the signal uh one can transform it to the rotating frame i won't bore you with the details one can add uh, more and more spins um which 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 kind of interact with each other okay and uh, then one looks at so that was the initial state preparation in nmr then one can look at you know how to implement gates and like i said you know rf pulses in the megahertz range these are the ones that that disturb the system these are the ones that uh, these are the 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 building blocks of an nmr signal they are the ones that tickle the spins in some sense make them resonate and uh, you know uh energy is pumped into the system energy is absorbed by the spins energy is given out and the nmr signal is collected and one can represent the, these pulses as uh, e to the power minus i h uh, d by h cross where h of course is the hamiltonian the spin hamiltonian and t is the duration of the pulse and one can apply these pulses around the x or the y direction with different kinds of phases so the the um the angle of the pulse is a combination of the duration of the pulse and the frequency at which it's applied now combining these two generators or these two rotations one can it's possible to implement any kind of operation and any kind of gate 
Of course, in NMR, rotations about the z-axis cannot be implemented directly. So, but, but one can, you know, uh, decompose these rotations or these unitary operators into further kinds of composite pulse cascades, which I'll talk about slightly later. So, this is a general one qubit gate, uh, which has an angle theta and a phase phi. And for instance, I can have a Hadamard gate, which prepares a, a superposition. So if I have the qubit in the state zero, uh, the, the Hadamard gate acts and, and puts the qubit in the state uh, one by root two, zero plus one. So it creates a superposition state. And the NMR pulse sequence to achieve this gate is that one applies a pi by two pulse on this qubit around the y-axis followed by a pi pulse around the x-axis. One can have uh, two qubit gates, which require, of course, an interaction between the spin. And like I said, there are two kinds of interactions. We'll focus on the J-coupling kind of, a scalar kind of interaction. So the, the NMR pulse, oops, sorry, sorry. So the NMR pulse sequence that uh, implements, uh, I've written that down at the end of the slide, um, that implements a control not gate is first a pi by two pulse, then one allows uh, evolution for a time which is equal to one by two capital J, where capital J is the strength of that scalar coupling interaction, that electron cloud mediated interaction between the two qubits. And then I apply another pi by two pulse around the minus y axis. And that would implement this in the laboratory, experimentally implement this control not gate. So if I have an algorithm, I build a circuit, Okay. And then I decompose that circuit as different gates. And each gate, I have a corresponding NMR pulse sequence. So that's what I've represented here. I have gates, then I have algorithms. I encode the quantum circuit using gates, which are a combination of RF pulses and delays into the spectrometer, or in, in some sense, into the machine language of the spectrometer. Now, again, there's a problem. So I talked about problems with the initial state. So what, how we how we solved that problem was that we we prepared a pseudo pure state. Then we said, okay, now we are ready to now we have a pseudo pure state. We ignored that identity, that uniform background. Now we are ready to to perform gate operations and perform the computation and implement the quantum algorithm. Now we've done that. Now we come to readout. Of course, so that's the most important part of the computation. You you need to know the result. Um, but then, you know, projective measurements, it's an ensemble. Projective measurements are not possible. And uh, so one is continuously observing here a, an ensemble average, and it's the evolution of the coherence. And uh, there, there are certain, of course, sel quantum mechanical selection rules. So delta M, where M is the magnetic quantum number of the state, uh, has to be plus minus one. So if, if uh, to explain this further, if I have two qubits, they can be in this in four different states, um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, if, if I have a, a change of state, so if one, one spin of one qubit goes from the 0, 0 to the 0, 1 state, or from the 1, 0 to the 1, 1 state, their delta M equals plus or minus 1. And the the an NMR can can pick up that particular signal, okay? But for instance, if both qubits jump from the zero one zero zero to the one one state, that corresponds to a delta m of plus two, right? Which is not allowed um, quantum mechanically, which is not for, which is forbidden um, in in NMR because we we can only look at we can only perceive or we can only measure directly measure uh, delta m equal to plus minus one transition. So all of these uh, problems, or not, well, I can't call them problems, all of these constraints are something that one, uh, as, a, as an experimentalist, one has to think about that when one designs an experiment and implements the, the compute, quantum computation, how are we going to analyze or read out the result? So. Of course, a direct way is in NMR is that we have to measure the FID, and that corresponds to measuring the expectation value of the transverse spin magnetization components. 
if I need to measure the population difference, then I convert the population to a transverse coherence because that's what I can do. No, I, I have to have that delta m equals to plus minus one um, uh, constraint in place. So I use the RF pulse, I convert the population, and I again measure the FID. Uh, so, but then, you know, it all comes back to how do I perform the readout? And for that, we've come up with NMR spectroscopists, have come up with, with a technique called quantum state tomography or QST. And uh, so what happens is that for a system in a mixed state, we know that quantum mechanically, the density operator uh, can fully describe the state. It has two to the power two n elements. And uh, this, this is, of course, more than the amount of information that is contained in a single NMR spectrum, because the single NMR spectrum can only detect frequencies or the lines in that single NMR spectrum correspond to uh, transitions which, which have this delta m equals to plus minus 1. So what do I do? I do a kind of spin tickling experiment. I reconstruct or tomograph. Tomograph comes from the word um, slicing. So I take different slices or different um, views of this complete density matrix. And um, because I, I have a constraint that I can only look at those NMR lines which show up in my, in my NMR spectrum. So I perform some kind of experiment and I do a readout of those four lines. Okay. Then again, I do a slightly different experiment. Again, I read out the information which is encoded in those four lines. So I perform a huge set of experiments and then, you know, kind of move back, move back and forth between the spectrum and the information about the density operator. And finally, I reconstruct or I tomograph the complete density operator. So that's the... Now we come to various NMR success stories. So in the early days, uh, Rangit mentioned that we had used the Deutsch Yoza algorithm that was a kind of toy algorithm. Then people moved on to Grover search, uh, implementing the quantum Fourier transform, dense coding, teleportation, Shor's quantum factoring. Then uh, people also looked at multi-qubit entanglement, test and used it as a test bed for decoherence models. Qubit computing, so on and so forth. There are lots and lots of success stories. Uh, this was the earliest success story of uh, NMR, where they implemented Shor's uh, quantum factoring algorithm. They used seven qubits, a huge number, 128 pulses on seven qubits, and factored the number 15. Now you might say, oh, that's you know trivial. Oh, who doesn't know the prime factors of 15? Yeah, but you know, as an experiment, the first experiment on a quantum computer. It's pretty impressive. So um, just to expand, there are various arenas. There's the arena of quantum algorithms where NMR quantum computers have performed non-trivially. Uh, there have been the latest being the shows quantum factoring algorithm. Now using NMR, people have gone up to you know five digit uh, finding the prime factors of uh, larger and larger numbers. They've also found tri primes and so on. Quantum simulation, um, NMR has made great strides. They've simulated, people have simulated the, the molecular hydrogen, obtained its ground state energy. Uh, people are looking at implementing quantum Baker's map, um, also looking at, you know, simulation of pairing Hamiltonians. There's a lot of work being done, sorry, using NMR to simulate pairing Hamiltonians. Um, then the third arena, of course, is decoherence suppression. And these are techniques which have been tried and tested. Many of them we've also worked with in my lab. Uh, tried and tested on NMR quantum computers. But these are in general, you know, they, are, they have a general application to any kind of quantum, um, quantum technology. Uh, so one can use, you know, various optimal control techniques. One can develop quantum error correction schemes. One can look at Urich dynamical decoupling sequences to prolong the lifetime of quantum states, which are very fragile. The fourth arena is very interesting. It's something that I am really interested in, and that is, you know, how can an NMR quantum computer contribute to foundational issues? So, what is the role of quantum contextuality, and can it, like quantum entanglement, can it possibly contribute to computational speed up? And can one characterize multipartite entanglement? Can one compute using qubits, which are qubits, qubits, etc.? So 
This is the summary of NMR quantum computing. It's the first prototype quantum computer which worked. It has currently the largest qubit register size. Well, uh, we've been beaten by the IBM guys, but in, amongst the other technologies, there's a very high degree of quantum control. Uh, the natural decoherence times are very, very long. Uh, there are also several schemes now available for decoherence suppression. The problems of initialization and readout uh, have been uniquely solved. And it's a robust quantum technology which is translatable to other quantum hardware. Of course, there are many, many challenges. The first thing of, is the, the low spin polarization. So we're always you know, trying to work with pseudo pure states, which have very, very small polarization. The intensity of the NMR signal is really, really small. You know? So, and then a, an increasing scalability is another problem. So increasing, I think, NMR qubits can possibly go up to like 15, 20 qubits. But beyond that, you know, that would be a major challenge. And there have been people who, who have, I mean, groups now all over the world are looking at various possibilities because so far it's been a fairly robust quantum technology. And um, sure, there are big problems, but can one, you know, do various things. Initially, you know, people said quantum computer will never be built, can never be built in our lifetime. But now that things are, the deadlines are coming closer and closer, the milestones have been achieved. Maybe, you know, NMR quantum computers will reinvent themselves in the next um, 10 years and come up with something else. <clears throat> um, so, let me talk about, I talked about various arenas. Let me talk about one arena, which is that of quantum control. Like I said, quantum correlations are very fragile and decoherence can destroy the quantum computation. There are several optimization techniques, GRAPE, genetic algorithms, machine learning algorithms, which can help in trying to protect these states. So for, for instance, this is the way a GRAPE algorithm works. Um, it's a kind of you, you come up with a control amplitude. So say I want to apply an RF pulse instead of, and I had written down, you know, I decomposed the unitary as a sequence, the gate that I needed to be applied as a sequence of RF pulses. And those RF pulses were applied with a specific flip angle and a specific um, uh, phase for a specific time duration. But say I don't, I, I don't give it those constraints. So I tell the algorithm that, you know, this is a target unitary operator and this is some kind of guess operator. And now you decide. So I, I just give it the time steps and I give it an, a kind of error function at every point it modifies. So it goes back, it applies the, uh, the, the pulse that it has come up with and then it checks its performance. And then uh, uh, according to a certain error function, which it always minimizes, and then it goes back and modifies the amplitude or the phase in the next iteration. And that's how it performs. It improves its performance function. Um, I also spoke about the genetic algorithm, which is, which is like an evolutionary algorithm. So, you know, in the evolutionary or the fitness landscape, which is, which is how life operates, which is how Darwin's theory of natural selection works, that there is every organism, um, you know, works on the concept of, of uh, mutations and uh, propagation and reproduction. And, that's, and it keeps on increasing its fitness. So if a mutation leads to a very bad disease and kills a population, then that mutation doesn't survive. But if the mutation helps in, you know, the, the, the population being able to withstand colder temperatures uh, under some kind of global uh, cooling condition, then that mutation survives. So that's how the genetic algorithm works. It's, it's a different way of, of improving uh, gate optimization. And this is an example in my group that we developed using the genetic algorithm to, to optimize the, uh, a particular quantum gate against RF offset errors. Um, there have been many other techniques. One, of course, is called dynamical decoupling or DD. And like I said, you know, what is decoherence? Decoherence is coupling of the system and the bath, the interaction of the system and the bath, bath meaning the environment of the spins, system being the spins over here or the qubits. So how does one, you know, how does a DD method work? 
what it does is it decouples the system in advance. So if the spin, if the qubits don't talk to their environment, that means they don't decohere. That means that information of that computation can remain and can be protected against decoherence. And what DD methods do is that they add a certain kind of periodic decoupling interaction with a cycle time TC to the system bar. So that's what I've represented. Um, uh, these, these red lines are that periodic decoupling uh, that I add. And the system then evolves under some kind of effective average Hamiltonian. And that system bath interaction terms, which were the decorance terms, they get cancelled out. So in NMR, there was a, a sequence called CPMG, Carr, Purcell, Maibum, Gill, which is very well known to all NMR spectroscopists. And what they did was apply trains of equally spaced pi pulses, and they stopped the relaxation of the spins. So uh, there have been much more complicated DD sequences, and we have applied this to, so we wanted to look at, you know, there's something called the Zeno paradox, where Zeno was a Greek philosopher who said that motion is an illusion. And he used a method of proof by contradiction. And it's the same thing, the saying that a watched pot never boils. So if you, if you keep on uh, taking the lid off a pot uh, of uh, water or milk, which is boiling, it will never boil, right? So the quantum Zeno effect, what it does is it uses frequent measurements to kick the state back to its initial state. So it's some, in some sense, it's slowing down its evolution. And by slowing down its evolution, it's freezing the state so that, you know, the information, because then that information, if the state is frozen, if the state doesn't evolve, then the, then the state can't talk to its, then the spin can't talk to its environment, and then decoherence can be stopped. So this is a super Zeno scheme. There's a, the, the kick operator. The kick operator is called that because it kicks the system back to its initial state. And um, so you have a subspace within the, the full Hilbert space. There's a subspace which one wants to project. And this is the circuit to do so, the NMR pulse sequence. And we, what we did was we prepared a singlet state, okay, which is 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And then there are three other states in the basis, 0, 0, 1, 1, and the triplet state. So we wanted to to protect the singlet state, and that is the subspace that is being protected. It's a one-dimensional subspace because there's just one state in there. And now you can see that SZ stands for super Zeno. So with the without the super Zeno scheme, you know the state decoheres. Um, this is uh, on the right is a product state. So any one of the states, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on. And on the, uh, uh, oh, sorry, on the left is a product state. On the right is the singlet state. And as you can see from the triangles at the top, the with the super Zeno, with the SZ protection, the state remains protected all the way up to eight seconds, actually much further than eight seconds. We, we saw protection up to 10 seconds in some cases. So that's, you know, 10 seconds is a really, really long time. So if these states can, if their states can be frozen, this is a very nice way of, of uh, stopping them from decohering. And we went on to protect uh, two-dimensional subspaces. We also looked at the leakage outside of the subspace. We looked at entangled states because entangled states are very, very fragile, but they're also very important for QC. And we were able to preserve, using these super Zeno schemes, we were able to preserve entanglement very well. Now I move on to uh, another interesting direction, uh, which was exploring quantum foundations using NMR quantum computers. So we wanted to pin down questions of, you know, what is contextuality and what happens to elements of physical reality when we look or observe? What happens when we are not looking or observing? For example, what is the context of an observation? And that means that what is the by, that is what is meant by uh, meant by quantum contextuality so if you open your garage door in the morning will you find a peacock in there instead of your car or in addition to your car and the answer is maybe uh, it depends on whether your garage is in Isa Mohali because Isa Mohali has a huge number of peacocks and um, maybe I'm not sure, but I think Kolkata City does not have peacocks. So if you open your garage, if you're living in Kolkata and you open your garage, uh, you will not find a peacock. But it's very likely that in Mohali, you will find a peacock. 
So, um, of course, one then goes back to Bell's theorem that if a hidden variable model is local, it can be ruled out experimentally. And this has to do with watching, being watched and watching um, quantum particles. So the Cochin, the case theorem, um, cochin specker theorem, talks about pinning down, you know, contextuality. So they said that imagine there's a theory which is more complete than quantum mechanics. And it has the same predictions as quantum mechanics for observations. But the theory has value definiteness. So it is able to, unlike quantum mechanics, it is able to give, uh, assign precise definite values to observables. And the case theorem says that in that case, the theory is contextual. So that means that there's something real in this world that exists outside of our observations. And if you want to avoid contextuality, so you don't want a context, you don't want to live in a contextual world, then the case theorem says that then you must give up value definiteness. So then, you know, one can explore is quantum mechanics a contextual theory or a non-contextual theory? So does it have value definiteness? Is, are we able to assign value definiteness or not? And we use this to, to look at single cutrid contextuality. So, uh, you know, one can make, say, nine measurements. A cutrid is a three-level quantum system, like a qubit is a two-level quantum system. One can think of a three-level quantum system. So, you know, have the, the states assigned as minus one, zero, plus one, or zero, one, two, as the case may be. And uh, we were able to show, I mean, sorry, the Kurzinski showed that using nine measurements, one can reveal whether the single cutrid states are contextual or not. Um, and th what they do is they pre-assign. So look at this graph and uh, one can pre-assign values of zero or one dichotomous values um, to these measurements and then sum all these uh, values and the maximum value has, has to be less than or equal to three. Okay, and that's the inequality. And then one can see that does your quantum mechanical measurement uh, violate this inequality or not? Okay, so put in terms of eigenvalues, then the sum of all the nine expectations, the nine measurements that one can make has to be greater than or equal to three. And of course, for NMR, uh, you know, we, we, like I said, we, we're ignoring that identity background. So we have to work with traceless uh, observables. And we use a set of eight Gelman matrices uh, spanned by the plus one, zero and minus one eigenstates. We co-measure operators, so we're measuring correlations between compatible observables, and we reformulated the inequality and uh, show that you know if this state, uh, if this sorry, if this inequality which I've written below, great uh, all of this uh, greater than or equal to zero, if this is violated, that means that particular state is contextual. And how did we construct the NMR cutrate? We oriented chloroform in a lyotropic liquid crystal. That's the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we measured single cutrate. That's the circuit measuring nine different expectation values. Uh, we also had to apply gradients for this. That's the experimental design. So we had four different experiments uh, corresponding to four different operations. And then we followed the violation in time. And we indeed saw violation of the inequality for various states. We also tested a KCBS twin equality, which is more of the same. Again, we constructed a graph, projectors. And here in this case, we required five, me five measurements of 10 different operators. We rewrote the inequality in terms of expectation values, translated those expectation values to NMR observables, measured contextuality in an eight dimensional Hilbert space, uh, constructed the first the quantum circuit, and then the, the NMR pulse sequence. And again, we followed the inequality violation. And we found that uh, there was no violation when the transform state is orthogonal to the original state. Now, I just, I have very little time left, but I just talk about entanglement, which is another very interesting domain of quantum computing. Um, and, you know, in uh, like I said, room temperature, we're working with highly mixed states. And so the elephant in the room is, you know, are spin ensembles at high temperature um, entangled or not? If one looks at the entire spin ensemble, then not. But if, but we are always working with pseudo pure states, and within that context, there is genuine entanglement. So within the 
the pseudo pure state um, uh, small little corner or portion of the density made total density matrix we can work with genuine entanglement uh, we looked at three qubit entanglement prepared generic states prepared the nmr pulse sequences reconstructed it from two party states reconstructed the ghz state the w state also looked at a new kind of state called which we call the ww bar state which is a new kind of entanglement because it's like a superposition of the w and w bar states and has very interesting entanglement properties and we actually had to you know perform a, a design and perform a filtration protocol to to convert between the ww bar and ghz states and that's the quantum circuit and the pulse sequence and we also did the two party reconstruction and we were able to capture correlation information so i've come to the end of my talk and of course it's my very pleasant duty to acknowledge my phd students they do all the work and i have the fun of of presenting uh, the work at various conferences um, and uh, i must thank my collaborators Uh, for most of the quantum computing work i collaborate with arvind who's a theoretician and uh, i acknowledge my funding partners dbt dst csr iser and stars mhrd and i'm especially grateful for funding in pandemic times to dst qst for for funding for nmr quantum computing and to stars mhrd for funding for nmr metabolomics and i thank you for your attention and i leave you with a picture of the night uh, time campus at isa mohali uh, taken by my phd student akshay gaikwad thank you for your attention and i am now open to questions rangit over to you yeah this is wonderful kavita very 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 nice i mean the first part the pedagogical description the nmr and how it can be used for magnetic resonance that was wonderful and later the volume of uh, work i mean you worked on so many problems is very very nice very so um now the session is open for question maybe we start with the question students asked in the chat Uh, I I said students. I mean, it could be anybody. I really do not know. Oh, okay. So the let, chat let questions. Me, let, me, let me stop. Okay, let me stop sharing. Let me have a look at my. Ha. Huh. Okay. I okay. can see a question from uh, Sham Sundar. Is that is that the first question? Yeah. Rangi. Yeah. Yes. The first question is Sham Sundar Shaho, and huh. he asks that does quantum computer going to replace every kind of classical computers in future, or it's only used for you know specific purposes yes it's it's a very it's a very good question um yeah. and uh, yeah. but yeah it, it your he's answered his question himself it's it really is going to be used in uh, for very specific purposes um it's definitely not going to replace uh, classical computers because most often the kind of of questions Uh, or kind of problems that a quantum computer can solve like i said you know simulation of uh, quantum system they are not things that somebody who wants to do uh, internet banking is going to be interested in then uh, uh, there is another question from kevel chatri uh, the question is do quantum computers store infinite number of informations Kavita, you heard you you got the question. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I got I got dis I got disconnected. I'm back now. I, okay. I, oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I. So the uh, question I still, is. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks. Do quantum computers store infinite number of informations? um no no they have they sh uh, it's it's a large amount of information but definitely not infinite because they're limited by the the register size so right. they they're limited by the dimension of the hilbert space that they're working with and most yeah. often we are not working with infinite dimensional hilbert yes. yeah even for a single qubit i mean the entire yes. block sphere that gives really a 
very large so it's yes. almost you know yes, continuum yes. Yes, but yes. one one particular beat stores only uh, like a finite amount of information definitely yeah. Yeah, and uh, there is another question from Sora yeah. that yeah. what advancement has happened in the present time to increase the time gap before decoherence actually takes place? I think uh, uh, he's interested to know. I mean, whether we can push back the decoherence and what can we do to do yes. that? Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. There have been lots of efforts in this direction because you know, um, like I said. Uh, one yeah. of course is decoherence suppression protection of states using various kinds of techniques but the other interesting direction which i have not talked about in this talk is quantum error correction so you know right. you anticipate and there are many many schemes which have been theoretically proposed and uh, experimentally implemented to look at various kinds of errors in different things it could be in gate operation gate fidelity you know mm -hmm. or it could be in readout it could be an initial state preparation and and it, it's different for different technologies for, for different quantum hardwares but there's a lot of work being done in this direction definitely and, um, any other question i invite everyone to ask a question we do not have much time left so uh, yeah please feel free to ask okay um I have one question, Kavita. Yes. Um, uh, the question is, I mean, at some stage, I think we knew and uh, you mentioned that uh, it's basically that uh, projective measurements are not possible in the NMR. Yes. Hmm? yes. But then uh, typically when we uh, you know, teach quantum, study quantum, I mean, projective measurement is uh, one of the fundamental ingredient of the the quantum uh, techniques i mean it's yes, a, yes definitely so i mean is there any conflict i mean how how do we understand that yeah yeah so i think rogit i mean it's it's a very interesting very nice question um, i don't have a you know pat and easy answer to that it's it's mm -hmm. because it's it's a, it's you know um, but there are made various ways of tackling it one of course is doing you know implementing quantum state tomography but that's computationally, I mean, experimentally, it was very resource in intensive. You have to do so many um, experiments. And if you, if you add, like, like um, <clears throat> uh, for, uh, to do QST for two qubits, I have, say, nine measurements. But for three qubits, I have to perform 64 measurements. To, you know, so that really in increases, in some sense, the time for the quantum computing to occur. So people are, are, are looking at... Uh, you know, ways, different ways of of uh, uh, implementing projective measurements. That itself is an interesting question to us. That it's, it's it was given to us that oh yeah, projective measurements can't be implemented on an ensemble quantum computer. But I think it's time to go back to the drawing board and understand. You know, why why not? Mm -hmm. I think people have not not asked that question. So it's good you asked that question. Maybe you can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We are we are seriously looking at it. We are yes, yes. At it. I didn't realize that it's a problem. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, now 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 a theorist uh, like Professor Panigra, he knows. So maybe he he can come up with a scheme which we experimentalists can then implement. Right. Okay, so there, there is was another a, question. Yes, there is there was another question. question. Is, is there any limitations of quantum computer? I think one student uh, asked. Limitations in, uh, I mean, uh, limitations of what a quantum computer can do, or? I, I think it's a very broad question. Yeah, uh, there I mean, are, uh, I mean, definitely some limitations related yeah. to. I mean, what kind yeah. of calculation it can do? Right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. I think I think people are more uh, interested in what a compu quantum computer can do, you know. So and then then looking for the imp experimental implementations of that. So people are still looking for, like we have the Shor's quantum factoring algorithm. Uh, people are trying right. to design more quantum algorithms, which will you know look at solving different computational problems. Uh, which are uh, speeded up as compared to the classical counterparts. So there's a lot of theoretical computer science research uh, which right. is going on. Right. right. 
And I think uh, we are almost out of time now. Okay. And I saw Professor, uh, our, uh, we just, uh, I think Professor Ravi Shankar, I saw him. Uh, he's waiting for chairing the next session and Professor Dipankar Holmes talk. Uh, yeah, you, 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 the, <laughs> you, sorry, Professor, I, that uh, we are running a bit late. But okay, uh, okay. even then, if you please allow, I would like to conclude this session with one question, one student asked, I mean, please allow Professor. Yeah, okay. So the question is, I mean, can you please explain how do we perform gate operation in NMR system? I think it's very relevant to your mm. Uh, yeah, talk, yeah, yeah, so, um, so like I uh, kind of mentioned in my talk, uh, a, a quantum gate has a particular unitary associated with it. So if I have a Hadamard uh, uh, gate, that would be, you know, one by root two, one, one, one minus one. Now yeah. I can decompose that unitary in terms of NMR pulses. Okay. So I can look at the Hadamard gate and I say, okay, I can realize the action of this gate by applying a pi by two pulse with a phase Y followed by a pi pulse uh, of a phase X on that, on that same qubit. Okay. So similarly, each gate can be decomposed or can be correlated with a set of NMR pulses and delays. Okay, delay meaning the time during which the uh, Hamiltonian acts. So that there's a certain amount of work that one goes through, but it's kind of then standard because then you know that, okay, these are the set of two qubit gates or three qubit gates that I have to implement, and these are the set of pulses. Okay. All right, I, the, thank you. Thank you, Kavita, for answering that question. And in general, it was very nice to talk and uh, the you know, your introduction was really, really very good. So thank with you. that, I thank everyone, the organizers and everybody. And I think Professor Home and Ravi Shankar, they are waiting. I can see both of you. Okay. Hello. 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 Okay. Hi. So you can please start. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Looking forward to your talk, Dipankar. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Dipankar, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Ravi, after a long time. Right, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I think we met nice in Pune. To see you. Huh? We met in Pune. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have not changed much. <laughs> you too. <laughs> there is a lot of grey matter outside too. Yeah. <laughs> no? <laughs> Symmetry. <laughs> in you? <laughs> okay. okay. Can we begin? Yeah. Shall we begin? Yeah, yeah, you can start, yeah. Please yeah. Start. Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Deepankar Holm. I should first of all tell all of you that I have never myself met him personally. Okay, it is a good opportunity for me to meet him at least virtually, okay? But Thank I you. do know about him because of my other friends like Shrikant and people who have been very actively collaborating with him. So Deepankar Holm is a person who has been working on the foundations of quantum mechanics much before quantum information or uh, quantum computation became a buzzword and everyone joined the bandwagon of this area. So his interest is very abiding. His interest is very deep because he has been working on the foundations, quantum information in many of its avatars, on measurement problem, on interpretation, so he's obviously the right person to tell us about, you know, all the deeper aspects, okay? And one of the aspects of quantum mechanics is indeed is that uh, the very intrinsic probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics is supposed to give us a genuine random number generator, unlike all the other pseudo num random number generators that we have. So I suppose that is what he is going to tell us, how it is guaranteed. So let me welcome Deepankar again, it's and the floor is for him. Thank you very much, Dipankar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor Ravi Shankar, for your kind introduction. And uh, let me begin with a word of warm appreciation for the great effort put up by Professor Panigrahi and his dedicated team in planning and organizing this workshop. In fact, this month-long stimulating event um, has helped us to brighten, has helped to brighten our intellectual lives amidst these uh, extraordinarily strange times. 
So let me begin my talk. So let me share the screen. Okay. So Professor Ravi Shankar, can you please al alert me 15 minutes before my alert yeah, sure. time ends? Yeah, so accordingly, yeah. I can tune my talk and I yeah, do yeah. not appear to yeah. be too rushed. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, thanks. You can call me Ravi Shankar if you don't mind. Okay, and you can call me Deepan. I, I already did. I'm uh, sorry. Okay, you already did. So I also I hope to meet you sometimes. Yeah, we do. I do. I yeah. have also heard about you, but unfortunately, we are. So as you can see from the title of my talk, uh, the topic concerns aspects of what may be called the issue of randomness. Well. The topic of randomness has been much debated for a very long time. In fact, starting from 12th and 13th century, when many Italian and French philosophers speculated a lot about inevitability of chance in natural processes. And the underlying question that was much discussed, what, what is really meant by chance events. And, and in the modern context, this question can be phrased as the issue of certifying and quantifying randomness. And this will be what, and this will be the issue with which that my talk will be concerned. Uh, well, uh, one may say that schemes to generate random looking numbers, which do not have any recognizable pattern, are easy to come up. But to what extent these numbers are truly unpredictable cannot be assessed easily. And this is what constitutes the core problem of this issue. So let us first examine what is the situation as regards mathematical characterization of randomness. It is indeed a curious historical fact that although mathematicians have tried to understand the notion of randomness starting from the times of Laplace and so on, uh, only during mid 50s, I mean, during mid 60s, really, thanks to the work by mathematicians like Kolmogorov and others, considerable progress was made in characterizing randomness mathematically. It was realized that precise definition of randomness is possible use only using algorithmic uh, information theory and an al algorithmic notions such as complexity. But importantly, another very surprising realization that was revealed during the works of those 60s and 70s by various mathematicians, that there is a fundamental limitation inherent in pure mathematical logic that makes certification of randomness not possible. And this limitation in turn is related to uh, the central theorem in the foundations of mathematical logic, namely the celebrated Guedel's incompleteness theorem. Of course, in however, the, so mathematically, the certification of randomness remains an open question. And, in, and, the, and, and the, although the topic in itself is quite a rich topic, the whole issue of how randomness is defined algorithmically and uh, how the limitation, the fundamental limitation arises from Guedel's theorem, the discussions related to these issues will be kept outside the ambit of the present talk. I shall only refer to this wonderful lucid article, which provides a, a semi-technical account of the arguments here. And some relevant references are mentioned in this article. In particular, I may mention that anyone who is interested to know Guedel's incompleteness theorem in, a, in, a, in an easily accessible way, there's a wonderful book by, uh, by uh, which is mentioned here, uh, titled The Goidel's Proof by Nigel and Nyman. But anyway, uh, so let us now move on that how, given this mathematical inherent problem in characterizing randomness, it is then in inevitable that for re generating re randomness, one has to rely on the unpredictability of physical process. So therefore, the whole issue of reliability of any generated randomness is dependent on the extent to which the physical process which is, that is used to generate the random numbers are 
un unpredictable. And this whole issue of extent of unpredictability is what is related to the issue of quantification of randomness. And this is what also we will deal with in this talk. Apart, uh, first, we'll deal with the issue of certification, given this mathematical limitation in certifying randomness. So at this stage, before proceeding further, uh, the, the, what is important is to make the following remarks. And that, is, and that will be crucial for, uh, for the rest of my talk. Uh, one may prima facie argue that, well, if so, what is what what should be an ideal run, random number generator? One may argue that well, if I have a random number generator, which I know and I know the user knows the scheme that is being used to generate reliable random numbers, and also the user ensures. Suppose one is going to use this random number generator for secure communication purpose, then the user suppose ensures that no adversary cannot know about the functioning of the device, then, then, uh, then, then, then that should suffice. That's it. So therefore, why so fuss about it? Now here, the first point that should be made is that even if the user is supplied with a device that can be trusted, even then, during the functioning of the device, the device can develop imperfections. Can there be uncontrollable noise that can arise? There can be accidental failures. There can be components. There, you know, there will be the aging effect of the components as the device is used over time. So how does one then assess the reliability of the random numbers that are generated by the device? And then comes the another key question that the device that what is now recognized for the purpose of ensuring secure communication, that one has to have a device which should be to, should be allowed to be knowable to an adversary. This is known as the central tenet of secure communication. And that was first stated by father of information theory, Claude Shannon. And in the form he stated, he, it was put as follows, that any secure communication has to be designed such that one should allow for the possibility that the adversary knows about the functioning of the device. So it is thus clear that even if the user knows the operations that are being used to generate random numbers, even then the device is not trustworthy due to the, uh, as I said, the noises and imperfections. And also furthermore, the device has to be regarded to be knowable to the adversary. So the ideal random number generator satisfying these two conditions should be such that it should be a black box from the user perspective, but it should be fully knowable from the adversary. As Shannon had further stated very precisely, even to begin with, if the adversary have no knowledge about the device, one has to assume that over time, it can develop sufficient familiarity with it. Okay, now you all know that another important remark to make before I proceed that to define clearly the focus of the talk. You all know when, whenever we use the term, the notion of randomness, it conjures up so many diverse applications in different areas of sciences, ranging from cryptography, say, numerical simulations of physical and biological systems, and, say, and even in, in the, the, the much discussed randomized control trial techniques used for testing efficacy of drugs, and more importantly, in our current times in testing the efficacy of COVID vaccines. And strikingly also such techniques using controlized, uh, co the control randomized trials have been used in the area of economics most spectacularly, thanks to the pioneering contribution by the Indian economist Abhijit Banerjee and his collaborator Esther Dufflo. But the important point that I would like to stress in all these diverse applications of randomness, the way the notion of randomness is used is essentially context dependent. So the extent to which the reliability of randomness is required, the way it is certified, 
the way it is quantified will be dependent on the specific application for which it, that idea of randomness is being used. And in this talk, our entire discussions will be geared to the end for ensuring what I've already indicated, indicate, ensuring what may be called secure communication, satisfying the two conditions I've already stated. And this is the most important condition which I have already clarified by untrustworthy dev devices, what we mean. And the Shannon's central tenet of modern secure communication, I've already stated, it was first stated in 1949. And now in the modern context of studies, uh, uh, this, uh, the importance of this central tenet was, has, been, has been discussed in various contexts, but this is one particular reference that is cited here that can be useful for the students also. Okay, so let us, now this will be the touchstone by which we will judge the legitimacy of any existing random number that can be regarded as suitable for the purpose of secure communication. And that will be the beginning of my talk, giving a quick overview of different available random number generators and, and the argument that I shall make is that none of the variable random number generators, including the quantum random number generators, are sufficient for this purpose. And hence, that gives rise to the need for a fresh perspective for a new generation of random number generators. So this will be the important part of the talk to begin with. And then the core of the talk will be concerned with what the key ingredients of the studies that have been done over the last decade towards achieving those new generation of random number generators, which overcome the limitations of QRNGs, the quantum random number generators. And the fascinating insight revealed by this line of studies has been the understanding uh, that Bell, none other than Bell type non-locality plays a key role in ensuring what may be called genuine randomness. And that, so this is a line of study that is at the crossroads between quantum foundations and information theory. So my, uh, within the allotted time, which I shall try to explain clearly the, what are the key concepts underlying these studies and what, what is that, and, uh, and some details of the approach, but not much. And also the question that arises from these studies, the fundamental question about this relationship between randomness, entanglement, and non-locality. Since bell type non-locality is realized to be a crucial resource for the violation of bell type inequality or bell type non-locality is realized to be a key resource for generating genuine random numbers. And entanglement is a necessary resource for bell type non-locality. By non-locality, I shall always mean bell type non-locality. So the, uh, the understanding the relationship between three, these three notions has become, has acquired considerable significance in particular, their quantitative relationship in the sense that whether they are quantitatively commensurate in that if, if you have a greater amount of entanglement, larger amount of non bell type non-locality, does it necessarily ensure a greater amount of genuine randomness? Henceforth, I will use the term genuine randomness as a randomness that is generated satisfying the two conditions that I have mentioned earlier, in, and also in, including the Shannon's tenet. Okay, so now another point is that since uh, in, the, in this talk, it, it will not be possible to go into the details. This talk is essentially based on this comprehensive treatment given in this, our latest paper. And where this the perspective that I shall be presenting in this talk has been elaborately developed in this paper. And also all other relevant details are given. As, and as I go along the talk, when I, whenever I indicate some basic features, I shall refer to this paper for the relevant details on those particular aspects. So this paper builds upon the earlier works that has been done over the last decade developing this line of studies, but importantly also adds 
some crucial inputs, which I shall emphasize during the course of this talk. Now, the review, the quick overview of the available random number generators. First one, quick remark that when I say it untrustworthy devices, the random number generators which are assumed to be untrust, which, are, which, are, which can be assumed to be untrustworthy will be referred to as device independent scheme, the random number generation scheme based on RNGs. And random number generating schemes which have to assume that the devices are trusted will be referred to as device dependent random number generating schemes. So our, our goal is to achieve device independent random number generating schemes. Now, the pseudo random number generators I don't, are, are very well known that you know, these are the pseudo random number generators. And this uh, pseudo random number generators, the basic problem with the pseudo random number generators is that they have to assume that the adversary has, has no knowledge about the operations that are being used for generating the random numbers. So it does not satisfy Shannon's tenet. And another point I'd like to stress here, Pima Fisi, it may seem, it may be argued by someone that, well, we know that there exist statistical tests of randomness in public domain, the well-known NIST test, the National Institute of Standards and Technology tests, which, uh, uh, which can certify whether there are patterns in the sequence of numbers that are generated. So, so, uh, so then if I have a random number generator which satisfies all these statistical tests of randomness, that should satisfy, and that should suffice. But then an important realization was made by the studies in the beginning of this century that no finite set of no finite set of such statistical tests are complete, even if and and, and some random number generators were produced that 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 has the, the random num the sequence of numbers produced by them have underlying patterns which are not detected by the available statistical tests of randomness. So that gave rise to the need to have really dependable random number generators. And that also led to the development of QRNG. Well, uh, the other type of RNG that exists, which is commonly referred to as sometimes as true RNGs, these are all classical mechanics based. They use, they use classical uh, physical processes, which are, which are hard to practice. But this classical me mechanics based RNGs assume really in practice unpredictability. Because as you know, there is no, no such thing as inherent randomness in the classical world. So if a classical process appears to be random, it is only because of our incomplete knowledge of the relevant initial conditions and the interaction. So this type of RNGs, which are often re referred to as true RNG, and it's really misleading term, uh, really de depends upon assuming a, an upper bound to the computational power of an adversary. So it does not satisfy Shannon's tenet and is unusable for a reliable, secure communication. Now, next comes the the, the, the most important part that is the about QRNGs. Now this, uh, this is the QRNGs. This QRNG already Professor Ravi Shankar has mentioned. This QRNGs uh, try to harness the irreducible statistical feature of quantum mechanics. And if quantum theory is assumed to be a complete description, providing complete description of the state of a system, then uh, such randomness uh, can be apparently considered to be truly random. Now, what are the caveats involved in QRNGs? Now, first of all, uh, and uh, of course, you are all aware the uh, history. Uh, first, let, uh, here I may also remark that historically, the first QRNGs were uh, devised in 2000. That was the beam splitter based QRNG by the GISA group and also. Then the Zeilinger group also came up with QRNGs. Now, these QRNGs, uh, I will now explain the caveats. 
And here at, the, at, at this stage, I just also should make a broad remark. When I'm talking about the limitations of the existing RNGs, these are strictly with reference to the, their use in the context of secure communication. So these RNGs would, it, you know, may be useful for, uh, for random number, use of random sequences in different contexts. So our, my discussion is essentially focused on judging whether the, for the purpose of secure communication, it is adequate or not. And the two conditions I have earlier mentioned should be kept in mind. Now, the first point is about satisfying Shannon's tenet. So how, how, do you, how do you know that the QRNG that has been supplied has not been tempered with to begin with? For example, you are, or have ordered a beam splitter based QRNG and the supplier and the adversary tempers with the beam splitter you, introduces some undetected bias. So once you have the outputs from it, by looking at the outputs without knowing the inner working of the device, how can you guarantee that the output is really random? This is the first point. The second point, even if the QRNG is provided by the trusted supplier, by the way, all these caveats also apply to, to, to any other random number generator that, that is available. So even if it is supplied by a trusted friend, as I have already stated in the beginning, it can deviate from its intended design during the functioning of the device. Furthermore, this point is often overlooked. This is what is now regarded to be a very important point about, the, of a re, about really ensuring a genuine random number generator in the context of secure com communication is about guaranteeing the privacy of the generated random sequence in the sense of ruling out the possibility that an adversary can generate that sequence in advance and can just copy it onto the memory of a device and supply it to you. So this, this is also not ruled out by, this possibility is also not ruled out by any of these random number generators, including QRNG. For example, if you take the beam splitter based I already mentioned, the beam, if, even if it is supplied by the trusted friend, the beam splitter May develop they may, may develop un bias, uncontrollable bias during. There may be some uh, the the beam splitter imperfection during the functioning of the device can develop imperfections. The the transmittivity and the reflectivity coefficients can change from what has been provided, so on. So how, so how to rule all this possibility out? Apart from from these two points about the adversary, to, about protection against the adversarial attack. Then the, the question then, I hope I have been able to by this time convince you the need for going beyond QRNGs. And interestingly, what has been realized that for going be, beyond QRNG, one has to harness a, a, a foundational insight that has been gained over the last many years. And it turns out that the violation of belt type inequality can be used to guarantee genuine randomness. But the underlying logic for that is different in the sense belt type non-locality had been used earlier or derived earlier. So I shall clarify that this the basics of this line of study, how it, it is, uh, how the how one ensures genuine randomness using violation of bell type inequality. And one needs to also invoke the condition of signal locality. Now, of course, the condition of signal locality is what is implied by relativistic causality. So that is a fundamental feature of nature. So, so what happens really is that this line of study has is essentially based on a fresh perspective on bell type inequality based on a derivation of bell type inequality, not from local realism, the way the canonical derivation is done. But the derivation of bell type inequality for this approach is done from what may be, what I shall explain, the condition of predictability and this condition of signal locality. So once you derive the usual bell CHS inequality from the condition of predictability, 
then you realize that violation of bell type inequality has twin significance. On the one hand, it rules out local realism. On the other hand, it implies perfect unpredictability of measurement outcomes violating bell type inequality. And what is important, this violation is, and, and it is the experimental data uh, generated during the course of measurements of the correlations that occur in bell type inequality that ensure this violation of the condition of predictability, that is the generation of irreducible randomness. So I, I shall now explain this gradually. So the, out, so the up, essential upshot is that in this way of generation of randomness, the output randomness that is generated is, uh, is secure with respect to any hypothetical, to any actor, hypothetical actor who, who may real or hypothetical actor say if who can have knowledge about the the measurement devices can have it can can even have knowledge about the measurement settings used to show violation of bell type inequality even then the sequence that is generated in the during actual course of measurements is essentially private to the users who are testing bell type inequality. So this point I shall gradually clarify and expand upon. Now, to begin with, I have to first show as how this bell type inequality CH can be derived from the conjunction of the assumptions of signal locality and the assumption of predictability. Well, I don't have to tell this audience about Bell's theorem in the usual form. It is discussed. And, but what is what I'd like to draw attention to the fact that these are the seminal papers which really embody this evolution of the significance of Bell inequality from, from being merely a question of ethereal abstraction to real hardcore applications. And this is the work that showed for the first time the possibility of harnessing bell violation of bell type inequality for the purpose of generating randomness. And, uh, and the arguments given therein and the logic of certification and the way random such randomness was quantified was subsequently sharpened to, during the studies. And what I shall be presenting here is the current status of our understanding of this uh, a way of generation of random numbers based on essentially our latest work, which in turn uses elements from the earlier work. So let me begin. Uh, so this is the Ellis Bob scenario. Uh, so Pro uh, Professor Ravi Shankar, by the way, how much time I have taken? So anyway, so I was a home. Again, I can volunteer that uh, you're at the half an hour mark. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so okay. So, so I first quickly recap. I first quickly recap the usual way Bell type inequality is derived. The usual derivation of Bell type inequality is based. I shall just indicate the key elements because this. Um, has been discussed much in various talks, but I shall just highlight the key elements to bring out its contrast with the fresh perspective I shall be presenting. So the usual derivation is based on what may be called even by even descriptions of even of, of, of processes. So and this even by even descriptions of processes are based on the notion of realism. By realism, one means assigning definite values to individual properties, irrespective of whether they're actually measured or not. So any description at the single event level based on this assumption and this assumption of locality that those individual properties in any one of the two wings are independent of the measurements done in the other wing, then one can derive, as is well known, testable conditions uh, that is given by the Bell CHS inequality, which involves experimentally measurable uh, quantities. These are all the mean values. And one interprets the violation of Bell CHS 
as violation of local realism. So this is well known. By the way, at this stage, I can just only, I, I, for the benefit of students, I remark that a very comprehensive review article of the developments and all the studies that have been done uh, on related to Bell inequality is given in this very useful paper in, during 50 years after uh, the Bell theorem was originally discovered. Okay, now what is this new perspective? This, uh, first of all, let me remark that that 2010 Pironio work that I mentioned there, that first put forward the scheme for generating random numbers uh, using Bell type inequality. Prior to that, in 2006, uh, Jisa and his collaborator, Jisa Essin and Nasanis, had at first given the idea that violation of Bell type inequality can be a resource for generating randomness. On the other hand, independently, uh, this Kavalkanti and Weissman in 2012, but, but uh, this, month, this paper did not flesh out the logic of the certification uh, clearly or elaborately. On the other hand, this paper provided a new way of deriving Bell type inequality from this assumption of predictability and signal locality, which is relativistic causality condition. But this paper didn't talk about its significance or how it can be used in the context of random number generation for the purpose of secure communication. So what has been recently achieved is a clear, is a rigorous development of this certification procedure, taking into account the requirements for SQL secure communication. And in light of that certification procedure to make more rigorous the quantification schemes for randomness, which will be practically useful for the purpose of secure communication. And to, and this, uh, there were some studies done in this respect, important studies that over the last 10 years by Yassin, Skarani and others. But uh, I, I, I refer to our latest paper, which adds some more fresh inputs to it. And in particular, to, to make this certification procedure more rigorous. So I'm, I shall come to that soon. First, let me just quickly go through the derivation that was originally given in the Kavalkanti Weissman paper. So this is the notion of predictability that is used that suppose in contrast to the event by event object description used in the usual form of Bell inequality, if one considers an, uh, in general an operational theory which can uh, which assume which guarantees that okay if if each time I produce a joint state of particles uh, in a, in every run in an identical way this is what is meant by agreed upon reproducible preparation procedure that if the joint state is produced each time in an identical way then it is possible to predict with certainty the outcomes of pos all possible measurements so like in the usual Bell derivation. It, it is assumed that there is a general theoretical framework which gives even by even description. Technically, that is called ontological theory. Here it is what is considered is operational theory. That means concerned with only notions and quantities at the statistical level. On the other hand, in the usual Bell type inequality, it is the ontological consideration. By ontology, one means notions or which are essentially independent of what, whether measurements are performed or not, when you talk about properties and so on. But here in operational theory, you are only talking about observable quantities. And then you have the no signaling condition. I shall make more clear what the notion of predictability is as I give a precise mathematical statement of it. So this is the EPR Bohm scenario. And suppose Alice and Bob share a state preparation procedure where known, which is known to both of them and they have control over it, which is specified by the parameter kappa. And these are the notations that are used, capital XY for measurement settings and AB for the measurement outcomes. So, they, 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 so then the joint probability of outcomes is denoted by this notation given to a pair of measurement settings and the measurement procedure kappa, what is the probability of obtaining the outcomes PAB? Obviously, it should satisfy these two conditions. And then the notion of predictability can be precisely stated as follows. 
that that really means that the joint probability is either zero and one. Now, to, to put it more precisely, I, uh, the, if suppose you are given a pair of measurement settings x, y, and the measurement uh, in the state preparation procedure kappa is specified, then if x and y, and here we are considering for simplicity bipartite two qubit scenario, the bipartite qubit scenario. So in that case, if you specify the measurement settings, there will be four possible pairs of outcomes, A, B. So what this predictability condition really means that once you have specified X, Y, and Kappa, one of the pairs will occur with only certainty in any run. If you take an ensemble of runs, in those runs always one particular pair will occur and the other pairs will not occur. So this is the meaning of this condition. And the meaning of no signaling, you of course all very know that it, and this is the condition assumed at the statistical level, these probabilities are all at the statistical level. And this is the statement of the no signaling that the probability of measurement in one wing is not dependent on the measurement setting on the other wing. So you can drop the measurement setting in the other wing in the writing this. Now, just from these def two definitions, uh, this definition of joint probability written in this form and this form of no signaling conditions. And just noticing that if you just take this, this is the predictability and this is the well-known normalization, then immediately this follows because in this summation, only one of these PAB, if you keep X, Y kappa fixed and B is fixed, then there is only one particular A for which this quantity will be one, the rest will be zero. So you can write it as zero and one. This is only the key step involved here. So once it is done, then it is straightforward to show that the joint probability can be written in this factorizable form. And that is very interesting because once you have this factorizable form, that means the joint probability can be written in the product as a product of two single probabilities, then it is just a matter of simple algebra to deduce the well-known del CHS inequality. So this is a remarkable realization that the del CHS can be also obtained by considerations purely at the statistical level, while the usual way of looking at del CHS has been to based on ontological considerations. Ontological considerations, I repeat, just meaning dealing with even by even descriptions using notions that are independent of whether measurements are performed or not. Okay, so then, uh, then of course one may immediately ask, oh, that's fantastic. So we now have twin significance of violation of Bell CHS. On the one hand, it shows that event by event descriptions have to be non-local at the single event level. That means individual properties uh, and the non, uh, that cannot satisfy the condition of locality. On the other hand, the violation of Bell CHS implies that you know, since a relativistic causality is guaranteed at the statistical level, it, the violation implies that the measurement outputs that are generated showing the violation of Bell CHS are inherently unpredictable, those pair of outcomes. In fact, it implies perfect unpredictability violation. All the pairs will be unpredictable, what this derivation really implies. So this is a powerful result. So that provides a way for generating genuine randomness. So, but there is a caveat, I will come to that. But before that, let me just mention that, in fact, this is what really emerged from the study by Weissman and Kavalkanti. Uh, uh, but they didn't connect it, uh, they didn't apply it to the context of randomness certification. Well, at this stage, another related question is since now the violation of Bell CHS gets related to guaranteeing uh, genuine randomness or violation of pre perfect predictability con in the EPR Bohm context. So do the other types of arguments that are used to show Bell type non-locality like those using Hardy or hardy cabello young relations, well, they can, whether they can also be derived from the conjunction of perfect predictability and no signaling conditions. Like if you take the well-known Hardy relations, we all know that the simultaneous validity of these relations imply contradiction with 
local realism, that is, they imply Bell-type non-locality. So then the question arises, okay, so well, can these relations be derived from, like the Bell CHS is derivable from uh, perfect predictability? Well, this was, this was not investigated until our recent work, and we had shown that this can indeed be derived from perfect predictability. The logic that is used that if you assume simultaneous validity of these three conditions, uh, then if you assume the fa factorizability condition, and if I showed that factorizability condition is what immediately follows from perfect predictability, I had shown earlier. And once you have factorizability from perfect predictability, from factorizability, Bell CHS follows. And we show that factorizability together with these three conditions imply violation of the other Hardy. Uh, the, uh, uh, it implies that the violation of the hard, other Hardy relations. So perfect pre predictability the, uh, cannot be consistent with the satisfaction of all these Hardy relations together. Okay, similarly, one can show for Cabello-Leung relations. I shall not go into that as to just to summarize that the simultaneous validity of the conditions imposed on the four joint probabilities is inconsistent with the fact and hence and that can be hard. Deal. So that was a realization that not only violation of Bell CHS, but satisfaction of Hardy and Cabello-Leung relations can also be used for the generation of genuine randomness. Well, so now to some, just to quickly sum, sum, summarize the understanding that has been gained so far is that we have this twin significance, which I've already stated. So this is at the statistical level, and this is at the ontological level. Now you all know that at ontological level description at the individual level, uses ontic variables, such as, say, hidden, which are known as well-known hidden variables. And this violation implies these hidden variables have to be non-local, the example given in Bohm model. But discussions within this ontological context cannot guarantee whether the ontic variables have to be knowable or unknowable. You do not know whether they can be controlled. So the possibility exists that those ontic, ontic variables can be controlled, and then perhaps you can then have predictability. But then we have derived, we have, we have shown that violation of Bell CH also implies perfect unpredictability. So if on top the variables are assumed to be knowable, it cannot be reconciled with the perfect unpredictability at the statistical level. If individually they are knowable, then, it, then at the statistical level, they have to be also knowable if individually they are knowable. So hence, it follows from this considerations that ontic variables have to be necessarily unknowable and uncontrollable. So this is a very important foundational realization that has come about. Well, so 40 minutes, sorry. Uh, pardon, yes. So yeah. how much? You have, you have another 20 minutes. 20 minutes, fine. Yeah. So yeah. that is good. And, uh, and uh, since the topic is such, I just, uh, I, I, I seems I'd just like to request for the sake, sake of closure of the discussions that I have embarked upon. Uh, if 10 minutes extra for my allocated time is given, though, then uh, I can do justice to the content of the talk. Professor Ravi Shankar? Yes. It is uh, Prashantha's domain, but yeah, okay, I will Prashantha. assume the power. I will assume power. the power and say yes. Yes, yeah, yes, okay, please. Because uh, the, yeah, yeah. This, this topic is a bit... Uh, yeah, absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and, and yeah, I'm yeah. aware that, uh, particularly because in uh, there has been no other talk in this month-long workshop yeah, yeah. related yeah, yeah. to this issue. So, surely, uh, surely. Because, and this is an emerging new topic in, yeah, in surely, quantum yeah. information theory. And in fact, Prashantha, I, may, I am happy to note because so far... Yeah, any information theoretic schools in in India so far? This yeah, whole yeah. issue has not been properly. Yeah, you are yes. Yes. So I I ask for the liberty of having ten more minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please go ahead because anyway, long break. Yeah, we are we are because the basics I wanted to clarify, and then uh, of course. Anyway, so so I hope I've been able to uh, convince you. That first of all, the need for going beyond the standard random number generators that are available, 
And then I have shown that the way out can be provided by the violation of Bell CHS or satisfaction of RDCL relations, which opens up the issue of relating Bell type non-locality with gen what may be called genuine randomness. But but the, the, but the caveat here, one, one may again take recourse to Shannon's tenet of secure communication that, well, we have discussed the way Bell type inequality can be derived from the assumption of perfect predictability. But a key assumption in this derivation has been, which I did not purposefully state there, because I will now stress that assumption here, that it has been assumed that the preparation procedure is the same for every run of the experiment. That was the meaning of that statement I made, agreed upon reproducible procedure. So it is a reproducible procedure. That was a key assumption. Now one may invoke Shannon's tenet of secure communication and say that the adversary has full knowledge. Uh, if I allow for the adversary to have knowledge and control over the, uh, over the preparation procedure, then the adversary can choose to vary the preparation procedure in different runs and still be able to reproduce the observed violation of belt type inequality and fool the user. Because you say any statistics can be reproduced by convex combination of suitable correlations. So the bell violating statistics can, so a priori one cannot rule out the possibility that can also be reproduced by the, by the convex combination of correlations arising from different preparation procedures. I, I give you a simple example to illustrate what is involved here. Say, for example, you have the coin tossing case. It is the both head and tail occur with equal probability. Now, suppose I give you a, a mixture of coins, have biased coins. One is biased so that both sides is head, the other is both side tail. And you are given the coin and you do not know that the adversary has tempered with the coin and you toss it, you will get the same statistics as that what you will get by assuming unbiased coin. So the adversary can temper with the coin and, 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 uh, and then fool the user. So how does one, one, so in order to enable the violation of bell type inequality to be a resource for generation of genuine randomness, it is necessary to guarantee that even for varying preparation procedures, these statistics cannot be fully reproduced. In other words, what has been shown here that for a fixed preparation procedure, the pairs, each pair of outcome is unpredictable, all pairs of outcomes. When you introduce varying preparation procedure, then some of the pairs of outcomes may become predictable. Now, the question is, do all the pairs of outcomes become predictable by taking a clever convex combination of correlations arising from different preparation procedures, which a clever, if, uh, a clever adversary can exploit? And this was studied in our latest paper. So in the context of Kavalkanti-Weissman uh, derivation of Bell type inequality, in order to make it usable in the context of secure communication satisfying Shannon's tenet, this analysis is absolutely crucial to give a rigorous, uh, to, to give a logical rigor to the whole certification procedure and provide it the required legitimacy. And this is provided in this paper, our latest work. By the way, uh, my collaborators, I forgot, to mention my collaborators, uh, of course, they are mentioned in the beginning, and I shall come back to it again. Uh, among the collaborators, I'm happy to note that two of them, Shorodip Shashmal and Urboshi, are present in the audience, so they may make comments, appropriate comments during the discussion session, uh, if they like. Okay, so now, what uh, now the uh, what we what has been shown in our paper is that if you take a convex combination of correlations arising from different preparation procedures in order to reproduce both the violation of bell type inequality or to satisfy hardy cavallo lyang relations at least one of them 
can should not be predictable or cannot be factorizable. That is, you can reproduce these statistics only by taking convex combination of uh, or correlations. At least one of them would not be factorizable. If you take all factorizable correlations, taking their convex combination, you cannot reproduce the violation of Bell inequality or cannot satisfy hardy cabello young relations. So once that is demonstrated and it is shown that the most advantageous convex mixture that can be used by the adversary cannot compromise the security of the randomness that is generated in this procedure, you can then definitely say that this is a legitimate way of generating secure randomness. And once you have uh, achieved that, then the question then naturally arises as this statement can necessarily be made very unequivocally. And then this is the obvious question that comes up, that the question I've already stated earlier, but here it can be stated in terms of violation of Bell CHS or non-zero values of hardy cabello young parameter. For this study, well, Professor Ravi Shankar, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, means in, uh, taking into account my grace type, grace 10 minutes time. Oh, just a minute, 12.30. Uh, so you started at 11.40. Uh, so how much more? So 12.40 plus another uh, 10 minutes. So 20, 20 minutes. Okay. 20 minutes. Absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. So you please alert me five minutes before the end of this. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then... I do not appear to rush at the end to give it. No, there is no need. I think. Yeah, yeah, okay, I yeah. give it a, give it a good closure. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I've already gone. Now we come to, now to study this issue and also to make such certified genuine randomness really usable. You need to specify how the amount of randomness has to be. This uh, has to be has uh, how how one can specify the uh, amount of randomness. How do you measure the amount of randomness? So th that is the issue of quantification of randomness. Now, obviously, uh, for this quantifying randomness, you have to use a suitable quantifier of uh, information, and uh, canonical concept that is used for quantifying randomness is the notion of entropy, the way Shannon had introduced in 1948. Now, in, a, in Shannon's interpretation of entropy for applying it in the context of information theory, entropy is taken to imply unpredictability in the statistics of the outcomes of events. So here, let me just make a quick few historical remarks to put things in perspective. The concept of entropy, of course, you all know, is a well-known concept that was used in thermodynamics. But uh, a crucial leap was made by Zillard in 20, 1929, when he pointed out that entropy, even in the context of thermodynamics, has to be interpreted as in, implying ignorance. Ignorance of the positions and motions of molecules in a gas. For example, if a gas is confined to one corner of the gas a box, the ignorance is, is very low and the entropy is also low. Uh, so entropy is a measure of ignorance. And then uh, taking cue from that idea, the, the uh, Shannon had uh, interpreted ignorance as the flip side of information and went on to, to consider entropy as a measure of unpredictability of, say, a string of bits I have. By the way, for measuring in, in, uh, information, the, the fundamental unit of measurement is bit. And one bit of information really means that the smallest amount of information that is capable of uh, so distinguishing between two likely events. And in, the, and in the binary notation, one digit is equivalent to a single digit. It is zero or one. So it is in this sense we'll be using the notion of bits in and forth in this entire discussion of quantification. So Shannon's original idea, he put it, in fact, this is, this he put it in intuitive forms while he was deliberating on this aspect through his correspondence with von Neumann, 
In fact, he first sounded the idea with von Neumann. And the, his argument was intuitively as follows. This is interesting reasoning that um, he said that entropy can be taken to be a measure of unpredictability. The lesser the predictability is, the less able one will be to generate the entire message out, out from a smaller string of bits. In other words, the message will have less redundancy in it. And that was the crucial idea of Shannon, that less redundancy in a message can be taken as a measure of information contained in the message. And in fact, uh, he was corresponding with von Neumann what term he should use to denote such a quantifier. We are taken to um, that's quantifying unpredictability. And von Neumann famously suggested him, you, sh you should take you should use the term entropy. Originally, Shannon was thinking of using the term uncertainty and so on, but then uncertainty is used in different contexts. And Shannon and von Neumann said that you will always have an advantage in a debate because nobody has a definitive opinion of what entropy should be. Anyway, so this is where the entropy, and then after the subsequent uh, works in information theory have further sharpened Shannon's notion of entropy, has generalized it. And the most general form of entropic function is now known as Rennie entropy. I shall not go into those details. So the particular form of entropic function that is taken as a measure of randomness is this one. It's a particular limiting case of Rennie entropy. So those who are interested uh, can, again, look at uh, the references given in our paper. Uh, and this is uh, Rennie entropy, particular parameter characterizing Rennie entropy. I can explain a bit if someone asks me any real question. Uh, you know, many of the points I'm just covering very briefly. So if you are interested, uh, please feel to ask after my talk. And so this is the quantity which is taken and which is called minimum entropy, which is taken to imply uh, the measure of rand genuine randomness. And why is it so? Why this quantity is taken to be a measure of genuine randomness? Of course, first of all, let me say that it involves the quantity, which is the probability of maximum occurrence of an event. Now, the greater the probability of maximum occurrence of event, more less random the sequence becomes. Because in the limiting case of unity, the, all the events are predictable. So less randomness is associated with greater value of p max. So, so this is an intuitive consideration which suggests that p max could be a relevant quantifier of randomness. And the other consideration is that, as I have already repeatedly emphasized, that security of randomness in, in, in any application of secure communication has to be assessed from the perspective of an adversary in particular, one has to take into account the adversarial guessing attacks. And the best strategy for any adversary, what would be the best strategy for an adversary to, uh, to temper with the security of a random sun? We, we must take into account that best possible strategy of adversary in order, in order to guarantee the security of randomness that has been generated. And the best strategy an adversary can take, obviously, is to guess the most probable event. So it is that P max quantity, the probability of occurrence of the most likely event, that th these are all, of course, intuitive considerations that show that justify why it can be used. It is a relevant candidate to be used as a measure of randomness. The more sophisticated justification comes from this point, which I shall not try to explain at this stage because it involves certain technical notions. So if there is question, I shall explain a bit about this point. So anyway, so let us accept that this uh, minimum entropy is the relevant measure. And then the amount of genuine randomness is, can, can, be op, can be thought of in this way, just to give you a concrete idea that suppose you are given a state and measurement settings x, y, then in order to compute the amount of randomness, you have to compute the maximum of all these joint probabilities. By the way, here I have made a jump, which I must mention to you, that um, while in the certification procedure, all the discussions had been essentially theory independent. You may remember that only the two general assumptions at the statistical level were used. When we come to the issue of quantifying randomness, 
by trying to evaluate this entropic function and evaluating all these joint probabilities will be one usually uses quantum theory to get a quantum mechanical estimation of the amount of joining. So the random randomness is certified by considerations independent of quantum mechanics in a device independent way. And once it is certified, the quantification is done using quantum theory. Of course, one can do quantification with using a more general class of theories, which are called no signaling theories, which can go beyond quantum theory. And that study has been done. Some of the works have been done earlier and the latest works that we have done, they are all summarized in our latest paper. Now this, so I now, I, I realize I, I may be coming. So how much time do I have, Professor Ravi Shankar? Just, hello? Oh, sorry, 12 minutes. Yes. 12 minutes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm disturbing you. No, 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 I not have muted myself. My, uh, uh, no, no to, and I'll ask, and you please alert me if five more minutes remain, huh? So that according. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, now, now, so I don't want to burden you with the details. Now, at this stage, I just stress two vital points and then the final results, which are physically interesting as well as interesting from the applicational point of view. Now, forgetting about the technical details of how do you actually evaluate the different bounds of randomness, let me say that there are two relevant important bounds of randomness which are taken into account. One is what called the guaranteed bound of genuine randomness and other is the maximum achievable bound of randomness. And both these bounds to obtain the estimations of what is the minimum guaranteed amount of certified genuine randomness, you need to do optimization over all possible quantum states, over all pairs of measurement settings because you are taking into account the fact that uh, uh, that adversary can have knowledge about the states that are being prepared. So while the, the output randomness has been already to be certified random with respect to any ad adversary who can knowledge, who has knowledge about the measurement devices, has knowledge about the measurement settings, for the quantification also has to be done in the same spirit by optimizing over all states and measurement settings, and also allowing for varying preparation procedures of the in a, of the state that is prepared for the to, um, for the two correlated particles, which quantum mechanically speaking are in an entangled state. So this optimization naturally involves um, the numerical as well as analytical work, and and if to to, to be very uh, particular of particular significance is this guaranteed bound of certified genuine randomness. And I have stressed here the what does it really mean that this is the minimum amount of randomness that is guaranteed, regardless of whether one has access to the settings of the measurement and also has access how the state is prepared. The adversary is allowed to temper with by providing different preparation states that are uh, on which measurements are being done. And so th that fact has to be appropriately taken into account. Now, if one evaluates this way, this is the really the mathematical statement that uh, how actually this quantity, but this is the quantity which I'm calling the guaranteed minimum amount of device independent randomness, which uh, evaluating this quantity completes the uh, completes guaranteeing that the scheme that we have already we have certified in, in a device independent way, then the quantification has to be also done in a device independent way. For that, all these proper optimizations are necessary over all possible outcomes, over all possible measurement settings and all possible uh, states. Here we are evaluating it quantum mechanically. So this row is the quantum mechanical state. If you go to more general theory, this will not, no longer be low. Then, then I'm not going into further details of how they are estimated, but then, but then this is the operational meaning of the, of the quantity that is evaluated in this way. And the meaning is that if you are given any arbitrary state and any combination of pairs of measurement settings, then it is at least guaranteed that this amount of genuine randomness 
is generated by the statistics of joint measurement outcomes, which violate Bell CHS and satisfy Hardy-Sewell. So the bounds will differ according to whether you use Bell CHS or you use Hardy-Sewell. And the other hand, this maximum bound is evaluated knowing the state. So that maximum bound need not be device independent because this is just that if the user knows about the state or how, what is the maximum possible randomness can generate. This is of interest in, in different applications, not for the purpose of secure communication. But this is nevertheless an, an interesting quantity. The maximum amount of randomness can be generated. And especially from conceptual considerations that I shall come to it quick, quickly. So what this, all these uh, estimations of all these quantities have revealed uh, uh, so far in the line of studies that has been developed. Uh, it has been shown uh, earlier through the works of uh, starting from Pironio and then followed by Yassin and his collaborators and so on. The, what they have studied all, first using the Bell CHS violation, the quantitative relationship between this guaranteed amount and Bell type non-locality. And it has been shown that the guaranteed amount of randomness and violation of Bell type uh, inequality, that is Bell type non-locality, they are monotonically related. That is, That means if you have greater amount of violation of Bell CHS, greater amount of randomness is guaranteed. Minimum amount of randomness that is guaranteed is larger. So it helps for secure communication. And one, one has obtained, that this was the earlier study done first in the Pironio paper. Then you, it has been also, then in what in our paper that has been shown in our work, that this monotonicity relation persists even for Hardy and Cavallo Liang relation. You see, it is not a priori clear if such things hold good for Bell CHS. Like I said, when you are able to certify using violation, it is not clear whether even by using Hardy CL you can certify genuine randomness. Once that was realized, what will be the relation? It turns out that it is same as that of Bell CHS. Okay, then what is the relationship between the maximum value and the violation of Bell type non-locality? Here, there were a, a couple of very interesting results obtained by Asin and his co-workers that close to two bits of randomness can be obtained. That is the maximum because in the two, two qubit scenario, you see there are four equally likely event. So uh, the, the maximum amount of randomness using that measure I, I indicated is, is uh, two bits. So once, and what Asin and others showed that this maximum amount can be achieved using suitable choice of measurement settings, which interestingly entail small amount of Bell violation. That means small amount of Bell violation can give rise to, the, to a very large amount of randomness, in fact, the maximum possible randomness. So while for the uh, guaranteed lower bound, minimum bound, non-locality and randomness were quantitatively commensurate, here, here we have quantitative incommensurability between them. So this is between the maximum RT and non-locality. Similarly, they showed incommensurability between the max, RDD max and entanglement. That means even using non-maximally entangled states, you can generate two bits of this minimum amount of randomness. But for that purpose, the usual Bell CHS does not suffice. You have to use higher settings tilted Bell anyway. In contrast, what is the new result we have obtained and uh, recently it is shown that two bits can be realized even using pure non-maximally entangled states. Of course, the same results we have also shown that, uh, that while these results hold for Bell CHS, you see one point to be noted here, this in quantitative in inequivalence between these two and these two has been shown quantity in different contexts. But what we what recently what we have obtained that while uh, if you use Cabello-Liang relations, then this maximum two bits can be used 
both by using pure non-maximally entangled states and even for small values of the Kabelolian parameter. So it shows the quantitative non-equivalence between these three quantities in a single setup means even if you take a given state and a specific choice of measurement settings, then you can show the non-equivalence between all three in this setup. And for that, uh, you need to use Kabelolian rel relations. So that is an interesting new finding. And in future, uh, more studies are needed to explore its ramifications. Finally, I, I think I have five minutes, I think, Professor Ravish. You have two minutes. Uh, two minutes, okay. Yeah. So quickly. So, so let me remark that uh, of all this has been entirely theoretical discussion. So one may wonder, okay, this scheme looks a tempting possibility for generating genuine randomness uh, with the basic, basic theoretical works being done. What about that experimental realization? The good news is that... Uh, in 2018, an experimental implementation of this scheme using loophole-free photonic Bell CHS test has been reported. And very importantly, this was achieved ensuring space-like separation between the two measurement settings. You see, it may, it may appear suf sufficient for the purpose of genuine randomness uh, to ensure widely separated for this privacy-based application, widely spatially separated measurement settings with appropriate shielding. But no shielding can, be, can ever be considered complete. There may be some unknown channels connecting the two measurement settings. So for conclusive assurance of the unpredictability of the generated randomness, you need space-like separation, in principle at least. And that has achieved here in this experiment with the, sep with the separation being 187 meters. So to summarize, what we have found that the certification of genuine randomness necessarily requires bell type inequality in the sense that violation of bell type or hardy cabello can imply uh, randomness. But the quantitative relationship between all these quantities depend upon the bound of the certified GR. Now that is a that conclusion cries out for more deeper understanding and I know and warrants wider uh, and and there are you know, the potential and the potentiality of wider ramifications. You know, that will be explored in the coming years. One hopes and also so I've stated all the rest things. And so finally, uh, so one remark here should be made that although the this that experiment I have made uh, is practically that does not immediately lead to any practically usable random number generator, we have a long way to go, but it provides a glimmer of hope that such random number generators could be essential in gradients in the futuristic quantum technology. And I expect that in the next decade, we'll have a quantum technology based on genuine random numbers. So how the challenge is to how to adapt this line of study for realizing practically viable GRNGs. But whatever line of course this study will take, we, we know that basic science gives rise to ideas for future technology, but how actually the technology will take shape one cannot predict. It could be well quite different from the way it was envisaged. But here, it can be safely said that it has to retain essentially some of the conceptual and security benefits that accrue from this, from the approach that I have discussed in this talk. And as I have promised you, this is the twist to the quote with which I began the talk. One may say that this phrase, contrary to the perfection of things, in the modern context, in light of the studies discussed in this talk, has to be interpreted as contrary to the perfection of nature in the sense of satisfying relativistic causality, that chance events have to be, true chance events have to be linked with both prohibition of superluminal signaling and bell type non-locality. And deeper understanding is, of course, a challenging enterprise in the coming decade. I'm sorry about exceeding my allotted time, but this is a rather complicated story. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Professor Ravi Shankar, for giving me the extra time and Professor oh, Panigai. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, it was a very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, talk.
we are glad that you exceeded your time because we could get to know some more of it with a little bit more of elaboration. Uh, I have some questions, but I think I have a duty to open the floor to the others in the first place. Uh, let me look at the chat. Uh, please, uh, it will be helpful if you please read out. Uh, yeah, that is what I will do. Yeah. So the first question, uh, question is, sir, can you please elaborate a bit on the choice of minimum entropy over other entropies like Shannon entropy as a measure of randomness? Okay. So as I said, uh, these are the two intuitive considerations which, uh, oh, which lie at the basis for taking minimum entropy as a measure of genuine randomness. So the security of, as I said, the, the most the opti the, the optimum adversarial guessing attack would like to guess the most probable event. So the, the probability of guessing the most probable event uh, is expected to play a key role in any quantifier of randomness. But the more uh, fundamental, more operationally relevant reason is the fact that comes from the, pro because whatever I've discussed so far is the randomness is certified. We have a certified string of outputs. Then ultimately to make it usable, you need to subject it to uh, what is called the randomness extraction that you will initially what you will have from the measurement outputs is a non-uniform string of outcomes. By non-uniform, one means the probability of occurrence of each event is not the same. But to make the output usable for practical purpose, you have to make it uniform. And for that, the extraction process is applied. And for that purpose, and it has been shown that the entropy of the, the Shannon entropy of the extracted uniform string is bounded by the minimum entropy of the initial non-uniform string. And that's why the minimum entropy of the initial non-uniform string that is generated from the measurement outputs, which determines the optimality of the extraction process. This is a more technical reason yeah. for which you have to look at the literature a bit more carefully. Yeah, I think one would have to sort of go through the paper and work it out. Yes, yes. Uh, the next question is uh, somewhat along the lines I was interested in. Can you explain about the new result concerning non-locality, entanglement, and randomness comparing to the previous result of Asin, Piranio, and others? Why okay. space-like separation is necessary for experimental verification? Okay. So, so as I have already stated that for... Uh, it means in earlier it was shown that the monotone disk quantity, the, the guaranteed minimum lower amount and violation of bell type inequality, they are monotonically related. It was shown earlier. But uh, what has been shown also that this monotonicity holds also for RD Cabellol Young relations. So this is one aspect. Now, regarding achieving the maximum amount of randomness, it, it was shown earlier that this maximum two bits, because two bits is the maximum possible achievable randomness in this scenario, that can be achieved even using small amount of Bell CHS, that can be achieved using small amount of non-locality. So that's so it was realized that although the minimum bound is uh, commensurate with the amount of non-locality, this is not. But this, so this is between these two quantities. Similarly, such incommensurability was shown between these two quantities, the maximum value and the amount of entanglement, because for pure non-maximally entangled states, this maximum randomness was achieved. What has been shown in our latest work is that, that the maximum two bits can be realized in a way, so that it shows the quantitative non-equivalence between all these three quantities, because of non-maximally is used and small values of Cabellol-Young. But this is possible only in the context of Cabellol-Young relations. And small values of Cabellol-Young parameter imply a smaller amount of Bell-type non-locality. Okay. Thank and you. And so space-like separation, I have yeah. already mentioned that it is necessary because to give a conclusive assurance of the unpaired, because this derivation I gave for bell type inequality 
is, is strictly true for space like separation. In practice, one may have widely separated with sufficient shielding, but it would be desirable to achieve the space like separation to the extent possible. And this was achieved. This is the point to show that in principle, this is realizable. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, pending thank you very much, sir. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is Sonai Vishwas. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank you for this wonderful talk. So, actually, I was going to ask that uh, whether this thing has been implemented in any uh, existing gener gener generating random numbers in the security protocols that we have nowadays. Like, many of the security protocols use uh, the classical random generating uh, models. So as you mentioned in the last slide, so like we have a lot of uh, work to do before we can reach to the to that uh, that much of achievement that we can use actually these things into the random number generating generators. So mm -hmm. that was my question. I was uh, I thought I will ask, but as you have already answered that, okay. so yeah. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> Can I just add a point to that uh, question, uh, Professor Ravi Shankar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So this is so nice question. So we may want to also see that, you know, what Professor Holm mentioned is that it is, uh, we are far from being practical in terms of, a, you know, a, like a portable device or something, whereby we can generate randomness, you know. Uh, that, that is what he was hinting at. So, of course, this paper that he's highlighting here, has generated random numbers using the space like separation and so on. So once these random numbers are generated, then they can definitely be used for purposes like security of communication or any other purpose. So that aspect of the usage is not what I'm sure Professor Holm was talking about whether when he said that it is not practical. What he meant is that the whole enterprise of generating this does involve, you know, a large uh, structure with space like separation and that may not be as uh, practical as we would like things to be uh, at, in our fingertips. I, I guess that's what you meant. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for, Thank you. For Thank real you for practical purpose. Yeah. But what I like to stress that whatever for you need to adapt this thing, that's why I, I use this phrase to adapt this line of study, how you can realize practically viable GRNGs by exploiting this line of study. But whatever you do for that purpose, you have, it, one has to retain some of the conceptual key aspects of this approach and the security benefits coming to it. So that is the challenge in the coming years. That, 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 that happens at every stage of the development of futuristic technology. We are now only at the beginning of this emergence of a, what I may say, the new form of quantum technology based on GRNGs in okay. near future. Uh, I, I ask a question. Actually, I would like to ask a question. Yeah, Otherwise, yes. we will never get a chance. And it is okay. related to this. Okay. Uh, irrespective of what the random number generator is, there are tests to find out whether uh, the sequence generated is random or not, right? If you give yes, me yeah. some n sequences. Uh, yeah. So if I take that viewpoint, your space-like separation should be more a test of... Uh, quantum random number generator rather than the random number generator, right? You want to use verify quantum mechanics, actually. No, 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 no. no? Uh, the, the, the space like I said, the whole point of the talk was, I, I think, first of all, I, I pointed out that no finite set of statistical tests, because there are real random number generators that were uh, made in, uh, in the beginning of this century, that random number generators which produce sequence of numbers which pass all the existing statistical tests, but still they have an underlying pattern. This is what I had mentioned. And that gave rise to the need to have all these QRNGs and all these to go beyond the pseudo-RNGs. So statistical tests of randomness are not sufficient. That has been shown. But, and also here, what has been shown that if you want to sh generate random numbers by sh showing violation of bell type inequality, and claim perfect unpredictability of the outcomes, genuinely randomness. Yeah. Then the in principle requirement is to have space like because in the underlying theoretical argument to derive bell type inequality, we have used the notion of relativistic locality condition that there is no signaling. More precisely speaking, we have used the no signaling condition. 
that there is no signaling between the two things. So to, to ensure that no signaling at the statistical level is necessary, if you, you want to use uh, the violation of bell type inequality for generating genuine random numbers. Now, no signaling condition, as I also mentioned while discussing the experiment, that one can say that if I make the station sufficiently separated, introduce adequate shielding. So that may suffice for many practical purposes. And that has been already suggested. So what they achieved was that even it is possible to show generate such random numbers, ensuring space-like separation, which provides the strongest assurance of unpredictability. But if you can ensure what is required is no signaling between, no exchange of signal or you know, no, no uh, un unknown channel connecting the two measurement settings. That is what is assumed in the derivation and this approach. Now, in principle, one may argue that whatever the shielding is used, it is necessarily incomplete. So, in, so unless you achieve space-like separation, nothing is ruled out. There may be some unknown channel. So if one has, has to invoke those considerations, then one has to ensure space-like separation. So even if one in, invokes those considerations, what has been shown, it is possible to really in practice to generate genuine random numbers. But okay, it could be that in future you have such genuine random numbers which, you, which in practice you use in the context where you get sufficient shielding without going to space-like separation. For example, the generation rate in the experiment that I cited is low. That can be increased because the usual random number generators have higher generation rate and so on. So these are the technical points, but like in any development of technology, the and already these points are being discussed, how it can be improved upon and so on. So okay, it is just it, an emerging line of development. Yeah, so this answer has created many more questions in me, but I would, uh, I'll would yeah. i catch you some other time. Okay. But is it right to say, but is it right to say that you are actually redefining a random number in terms of a physical process? Namely, uh, no let me say, in the, to begin with, I said the generation of any random numbers, reliable, must depend on physical process. Exactly. That is the first okay. point. Okay. So okay. it must depend on the unpredictability okay. of a physical. Okay. That is fair. Because of the mathematical inherent limitation yeah. in defining yeah. randomness okay. clearly. Okay. And also, yeah. I, I, I'm, and, and also, I must qualify that it does not mean that the, the random number generators that are available are useless and so on. It depends no, on which not. context here. Yeah. So it is yeah, yeah, a secure yeah. communication, and to what degree of reliability you want to use it. Yeah. For example, even for the genuine random number generation, oh, it may be that in future people will have GRNGs which do not necessarily ensure space-like separation, but uh, ensure sufficient shielding that for all practical purposes they are sufficient for guaranteeing genuine randomness. Okay. okay, thank you. I think there was one more question. Somebody wanted to yeah, ask. I wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Ah. May I? Yes. Yeah, please introduce yourself yes. too. Yeah, my name is Alok Pan. I'm actually the, I also a PhD student of Professor Boom. <laughs> okay. okay. So, that's a nice talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have some one question. They said almost uh, maybe the comment type of thing. That is, there's a, a relation between non-locality and uh, randomness generation. Mm. And that you mentioned because there's a nice paper by Yasin and, and these collaborators. That is, even there's a small non-locality, I mean, uh, uh, yes. then you have a higher randomness. Mm. It is kind of intuitively clear that when, for example, um, a most non local, I mean, the highest non locality for the PR box, but this is a deterministic theory, uh, yes. case, you have the randomness zero. So this is very, uh, I mean, that they have proved in a different way, but it is intuitively almost clear. So one more thing that I want to add here, that what exactly you you guys have shown? Uh, in, in, in so, your... uh, you shown that the, all the ISIN demonstrations have been non-locality and randomness. Yeah. Small non-locality, maximum randomness. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, on a different work, Mm -hmm. As seen and others have also shown that if you have, uh, you can get maximum randomness for a non maximally entangled state. Yeah, so it shows, uh, no, no, it, 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 so, but it is. So these two, one invokes and there one uses higher settings tilted bell. So these yeah, are two setting, different is just one. Yeah. No, uh, tilted uh, bell inequality uh, is not a higher setting. Uh, there are only yeah. two measurements. Uh, you, but, 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 but you introduced the. the there are some details there. So what is important is that they 
this is a separate demonstration, non-maximally entangled state, maximum mm -hmm. violation of such. Mm -hmm. And the other hand, that is a, a separate demonstration. What I have shown that mm -hmm. Cavalier-Lyung relations enable mm -hmm. to show in a say, for a given state and for a given Cavalier-Lyung relation mm -hmm. that if you even if you use a non-maximally entangled state, in fact, there, there is a class of it non-maximally entangled state for which even for very small values of Cavalier-Lyung relations, mm. you can get maximum two bits nearly. So what is this small value signifies? It's a small amount of Bell non-locality because like small values of P hard D, non-zero, yeah. because yeah. it is lo local realism demands them to be vanish, you know, okay. like P hard D has to be zero. Okay. For, it's a similar to the small Bell violation. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, but th this can be, I mean, there are some extension of the works of this distinction tilted bell inequality, or for example, by using the pure. Yeah, but but we, we, we are using just a standard bell CH. Yeah, uh, they are I using Cabellolium. Yeah, standard one. That is, if you can, you can go no, no, yeah. more than two bits, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, randomness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah, those standard. are different lines. Okay, you are right. But so the my, novelty my question is, here yeah. is that using yeah, Cabellolium. Yeah, my question is that using this your Cavalier-Lyung or the Hardy type non-locality yeah, setup, yeah, yeah. can you extend this to the unbounded and normal strategy? Uh, that we have not studied because this is just we have the tip of an iceberg. There are a lot of interesting <laughs> questions to be studied. I fully agree. It gives okay. rise to a no, not only this question, but there are many which I did not mention in the talk and mention it outside. But this is just a, it opens up because so long you see. The certification was not discussed. That is a bit very surprising yeah. because Kavalkanti Wiseman paper was unfortunately overlooked in the randomness context studies, I think, because 2014, nobody, uh, because even all those people, as seen, Mesanes, uh, Pironio, et al., and so on. So that we have shown that this logic you can use, but that in itself is incomplete to apply to for certification. As I showed, you require to assume varying preparation procedure. But once you do that, it is possible to do that. Then it uh, makes the certification procedure logically very tight and also makes it a legitimate candidate for secure communication. So the, one of the main, main ingredient, ingredients of this device independent certification that you have proposed, and the, mm -hmm. one of the main ingredients is the self-testing. So you have performed the self-testing also and the robustness. No, 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 no. Not yet. Many things. I, I can be uh, uh, there, there will be many things. This is just. Once I have seen it, but it's a long paper. So I just. Uh, 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 no, no, no. So, so that is the purpose of this talk to make mm -hmm. one interested in this topic because as I realized. No, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Uh, yeah, this topic is not sufficiently acknowledged. This, this mm -hmm. is a new line of development mm -hmm. emerging. And, and I must mention here that this. Uh, this uh, 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 also, uh, I, uh, the, the collaboration that we are making uh, is also geared towards achieving the experimental realizations of some of the ideas that have been outlined in these oh, studies. Okay. Uh, Urboshi and uh, her team yeah. is working on it. Mm -hmm. So th this is a very comprehensive line of study we are going to so develop, in, both in theoretically and right? And that's a pace like separation. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm always stressing this pace like separation. They have achieved for but, all practical purposes. But for all practical purposes, that is pace like separation is because it, it also makes it dramatic and so yes, on. Yes, that yes. is fine. But really, if you achieve it, that is the point that, in fact, uh, uh, recently, we have, as we have also talked with uh, Kolbeck. For example, mm -hmm. one of the leading figures, Kolbeck, mm -hmm. who makes a statement that, okay, space-like separation is not necessary here. In fact, mm -hmm. he makes statement that because all this privacy-based application, it is sufficient to you, guarantee you have sufficient shield. Yes, yes. but, but these people are good, as they have written in their paper also, beautifully, that, that mm -hmm. may suffice, that they have said, that's mm -hmm. why. But his no shielding is perfect, and for really strongest assurance, you need. And it was dramatic to show that mm -hmm. uh, this can be done. So that gives line of studies a strong fillet, which Pironio again emphasized in his beautiful article in Nature, mm -hmm. recently, which I have cited. So a lot of things to understand more. Yeah, thank you and, very much. And, and also from, and what I find fascinating about this line of study that I'm emphasized to the student, there is both theoretical and experimental aspect involved in it. And we are working on it in a comprehensive way, not only theory, but experiments, also exploring new ideas. It, it, it is really at the crossroads of 
heart of what quantum foundations and also quantum information theory. You see the basic notions of entropy and so on, and also the notion of bell type ontological thing. So, so it provides a fascinating over a holistic outlook, which may have wider ramifications and on ramifications which he cannot guess. That's really a question once again. That is, uh, may I, Professor may I ask one more? Actually, it depends, no, because I think uh, on Prashanta, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll have, have to assemble again yeah, for the you, next session. That is, yeah. yeah, that is three o'clock. Yeah, that is three o'clock. Oh, okay, then it is fine. Yeah. So just to answer, as you mentioned about the experiment, so what yeah. you are planning to do, I mean, that's a, one, one thing is possible that can be entanglement based or maybe, maybe the PPI is a scenario based. Uh, Urboshi can so, answer this question. Yeah, actually, Alok, I don't think we can really reveal that right now, isn't it? <laughs> so let us have randomly do it and then we will tell you. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. But still, <laughs> we have many plans uh, and I mean, you know, I think we will retain it at that. No, it is a public said, forum. Yes, yeah, sure. and it's, it's a competitive a, field. Yeah. said that is a device independent scenario. So sure, sure. That I would stick to. Yeah, it is yeah, device I, independent. Yes, uh, sure. But so, then what we will precisely yeah, do, sure, sure, sure. I will leave it please, to your imagination. Please yeah. don't reveal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. thing is that I just wanted to say that when you are saying about the device independent thing, then you don't need to take any restriction on dimensions. So how can you do that? That's an interesting question. That's I said. In, in, by all of these theoretical yeah. arguments I put, those certification, yeah. they work for any dimension. Definitely, being, definitely. Uh, definitely. They work. No, no, but, but experimentally, that all these are very formidable challenges. <laughs> I agree, really. So, sure, sure. So, sure. so we have to make a beginning. We have to make a beginning. Sure, sure. And, and, and also, the, all these people are working uh, there. <laughs> The groups that did you know, experiment. Now that the conversation is moving into private domain, so I think we should thank Deepankar for a very beautiful okay, talk. Uh, yeah. It straddled all the areas, starting from uh, basis of quantum mechanics to implementation, probability theory, information theory. Very vast area covered in a very beautiful way. So I think we look forward to hear one more talk with even more okay. results very soon. Okay. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Professor okay. Ravishankar, thanks, and thanks all of you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Deepankar. Very comprehensive, very nice okay. talk. Okay. Thanks, Prashanta, for bearing with me. I took. No, no, no. Very comprehensive, very educational. Very yeah. educational. So I hope yeah. uh, you, uh, students have got some flavor of this line of studies. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Bye, all of you. you. Bye. 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 Uncle, it was very enjoyable. I really enjoyed it.